hello, hello. Let me get the uh, chat screen up and going here. Let's see if we can get this thing to grab it up. Um, probably have to do it this way. So last stream, we uh, took a look at modular modules. And we were digging in, doing uh, a troll bridge. We made a module, one module, um, which created quite an excessive range of modular possibilities from the same design. Almost 60,000 different combinations could be had from that same module. Um, for us, that's about average as far as design-wise, because we know the space. Um, we know it's going to expand. I mean, that's the whole reason that we set up there and do the construction and set down and do all the mechanical natures, pay attention to the logistics and do what we do. We know it's going to get wider and we know it's going to get larger. And we know it's going to inspire more creative uh, thought and processes. That's why we design it like that. So we were working on one and using Troll Bridge, I ended up Going back in and just double checking, making sure we had everything. We did. Uh, I did toss a name on it, uh, which is usually what happens. I give it a bit. I kind of sit down and I take a walk around the design. I say it all the time. Take a walk around the design. So I gave it a bit. I hopped on again this morning and was working on some other projects. Got delayed. Couldn't get on this morning. And that's what I was going to do was hop back on and do um, stream earlier. Didn't get back on it. Got sidetracked with some other stuff. Took longer than I was anticipating. Uh, but then that sets us up for the weekend. So no interruptions there. Um, so ended up coming up with a name for it. Uh, Fall of Flood Water is what I ended up coming up with. And design-wise, uh, this module here, I like to... When I make the names of it, it's kind of nice to take and hint at something but then surprise them you know with it because it, it kind of means both things right so fall of flood water is kind of hinting at you know the troll falling over uh the falls and stuff to get down to flood water which is the flood water flats down at the bottom uh the lower villages basically in the area where it is um so there's that concept there's the, the failure possibility in the module where the players don't do what they do, and that means that the village of Floodwater falls. It literally falls because it can't sustain itself, and either they lose everything they have or whatever. And then with its fall, right, we add that other layer, what happens outside the space itself. If Floodwater falls, all those bridges and stuff that travel through that space aren't being managed by anyone there. So the whole place goes to crap. <laughs> so you're kind of like, oh, well, awesome. So it's a, you know, a triumvirate of issues. Things, you get your your starting point, you've got the possible failures, and then the expansion from it being a failure, which creates a, a lasting uh, adventurous space, right? You want it to be something that creates more stuff. So in the design, and I'll hop over, the screen looks good here. Got the numbers are all good. There were some issues yesterday. OBS kept, I don't know, cutting out or something. So on the other stream, it popped this out a couple times. I don't know what it was doing. It was cycling something. I think it might have been because of the weather or something outside. But we've got some weather coming in today again, so that's why I'm, I'm on here now. It looks like it's going to be here in a couple hours. So if it does and ends up causing a problem, then I'll, I'll hop off and end up hopping back on or something like that. I know I'll be back on tomorrow. Um... Probably in the morning. Uh, I'll try to if, if I can do it. If I can't, then it'll be later on for sure because um, I'll just try to do whatever I got to do. I'll just pack it all into the morning. If for some reason I can't get on here, I'll multitask to, to get stuff done. So Fall of Floodwater is what I ended up coming up with for the name for it. Easy. It ties everything together, like I said, hinting at different stuff. So using... Uh, troll bridge right the foundational elements from three billy goats gruff right because we were leading a story away from that story and bringing it into another space we went through and we figured out all of the logistics and we tied everything together between all the points 
um, that reference the, the story's elements, Troll Bridge's core concept of. We grabbed all of that and we added in all the details, literally. I ended up isolating and naming the village from the higher area called High Bridge, is what it's going to be. So the upper village is High Bridge, obviously. The bridge there crosses a huge space, and it's a heck of a drop to the bottom, and the river system's ripping and roaring underneath. This system down is called floodwater. So when we get down to the bottom, it's called floodwater. And then there's roads that lead out. The river system runs out and goes out wherever it goes. The roads from floodwater go to other areas. So we have Tri Bridge, which is another area, Timber Vale, and then we have Tri Falls. Those three other villages that are out there. I ended up grabbing them from some of the other modular designs that I have because we're thinking, you know, the space. Fine as well, right? We're working in the world of Gricor. We've got contingency system. We've got a lot of different names of different locations. So I threw a couple in here. You don't have to use these, clearly, in the module. They could pick whatever they want. We'll have a huge list for them, and we'll get into that in, in a second. Uh, but at least we added some names to the stuff. So we've got High Bridge up top. Down below, we've got Floodwater. We've got Tri Bridge, Timber Vale, and Tri Falls. Timber Vale is the closest one to Floodwater. And then as you go down a little farther, Tri Falls is the village towards the bottom. Uh, even farther down, I would say, in the river system. Because one of the narrow paths that split from floodwater goes down and then it has like three waterfalls and then it ends up at the, the village down there. And it's called Tri Falls. Sort of built on the descent of the waterfalls, not really at the bottom, not really at the top. It's kind of like somewheres around in the middle area. Built on that cliff face inside that, that region. And Tri Bridge is another area that's sort of like a high bridge. Tri Bridge has three bridges that travel across a huge expanse. So there's a big, huge area, and there's a bridge, a space, there's a trading station there, there's another bridge, and it's not a very big area. It's like a huge, like, mountain area that it has up towards the top. There's another, the bridge continues across, connects to another high point. There isn't anything there. There's just sort of like a stopping point, people camp and stuff. Then it continues on, and there's another section on the opposite side, which is the actual village itself, called Tribridge, right? So, trading station, nothing, and then the actual village, but it's called Tribridge because it's a big, huge expanse. So, that takes care of all of those logistical naming processes, at least in that little span of it. I also went and looked up, because I... I knew that I seen it somewhere. There was a bunch of different stuff. We were talking about it the other day. Um, uh, goats, right? Because we were referencing the story, um, Three Billy Goats Gruff. There are goats, and I remember having this. There was a uh, herdsman who had a goat, uh, several in fact, that were trained. And they were using them to help herd and maintain the herd, sort of protect it. Uh, sentries, more or less, when they were out there doing their thing. They didn't have dogs or anything else. They used the, these goats with these massive horns. So in real life, over in India, they have a breed of goats, extremely large and also aggressive, right? They combat ready. So they, they fight them. They actually twist their horns and do all kinds of different stuff, almost like you, dragons do with their horns. Give them some elaborate horn structures by shaping their horns as they grow to make them have cool different things. And they fight them. Fight them. It's a goat battle going on. Uh, in India, they're called the uh, Madurai or whatever for it. So in contingency, in the world of Gricor, I already have them drawn. They're in here somewhere. Basically, they look like a really stocky, super fuzzy, hairy, uh, almost like a woolly mammoth kind of design. But it's a goat, and it's got an elaborate horn system. Uh, pretty nice. They look cool. Uh, they're called the Adura. In the generic term in the space, they just call them woolly goats uh, because of their fur. And they make a lot of clothes and stuff from them. They've got a really heavy butter protein content, um, really rich. 
that's their milk, right? Because they would obviously be able to eat these goats if they wanted to. Um, they can get their milk and they can make the cheese, right? They got the whole the whole process with it. So the the village up top, Highbridge, they have these goats. They're like a mountain goat mutation, I guess. In the real world over in India, they sort of bred these things specifically and just tanked them up, right? Crossbreeding and stuff and, and human interaction to create themselves one heck of a hybrid. Uh, but they got, them, they got them in real world as well. So I took a look at some of the other little aspects that we had created here. There's a couple things, nothing too crazy. Um, the escorts out from the village to the turnaround point where the caravans would be getting their travel uh, guardsmen, I guess you could say. Whatever they had, the caravan had found hired out or whatever. The city guard only goes so far from the village. So Floodwaters, Gate Guard, and City Watch help the caravans get over the first expanses of the space itself. Out to the turnaround location where the main roads are, and they can start to travel, and they pick their different paths, and they twist and turn. So they got the three bridges that lead away from flood water, and then those bridges have bridges of their own, obviously, because the whole area has got a lot of flooding, especially towards the seasonal change when the water stays more and isn't running as much. It just starts filling, starts filling up and flooding out the entire space. So it changes it up quite a bit. There's roads you could travel on, but the chance of getting stuck pretty high. And they don't know when that's going to happen. It just kind of, you know, a person traveling to the village wouldn't know that the roads are already starting to get saturated. So they would be coming with their caravan, and then they'd be like, bloop, oh, right in the mud. And then they try to pull their way out, or their wagon gets stuck, and then they have to get out and trudge through the mud and try to get back up to the main trail, and then get back to the village and try to get somebody to help with some horses or whatever and pull the caravan out of the mud. And then they just sort of block off those trails. Obviously, you'd be able to see it. And then, obviously, the winter goes through. And after the winter time, and the floodwaters start to recede, the area dries and hardens back up so you can travel on it. So it's pretty mucky and pretty junky. Uh, but there's the escort that comes from the, the village itself out to that turnaround spot to help get them back to town. There's also the point where they come out from there and meet a caravan that's expected. So if there's a caravan coming, they will leave the village and go out to that pickup location so they can escort them um, there. Sometimes a caravan will go out and wait, and then there'll be another group of riders that will show up from some other place that they have hired, meeting them there at a specific day and time that they're expected to depart and head to such and such location. Because the other villages have different higher outs, and the, and the range is a little different. Floodwaters kind of stuck where they are because they're making, they're receiving goods to make goods, whereas the other villages are just harvesting goods, and there isn't any process after that. So because of the way that they do what they do at Floodwater, because they can't grow crops and things like that, perishable items, their process is raw goods to material goods kind of thing. Whereas the other villages are, um, we harvest the crops and then they're just ready to go like that. There are some merchants that do make more finished perishable products like breads per se, instead of just the grains or pies or whatever. So they do do that stuff too. Uh, but then there's also the, the flip side of that, which is sort of the aftermath. So after all that trade and travel and everything's done and the winter sets in and, and does its thing, there are problems and such that occur on those roads and they have a different set of people that come in. So each location has their main travel companions to make their road travel as safe as possible. They each have their own individualized local protection. And then when wintertime comes around, they have a... a I guess, ranged group that will travel the road space looking for travelers that happen to be traveling because there isn't like a schedule in that season. So if someone's traveling, could be anybody, could just be somebody using the roads, doesn't even, could be from anywhere, not necessarily doing trade, you know, sometimes you might, but 
it might be something completely isolated. So this other band handles that completely isolated from the towns as individuals. My thought process earlier when I was looking at it, I thought maybe like a collection of some from each village gets together and then just keeps that road space going throughout the winter. And then they can make their rounds between each of the villages, right? And then back on the roads again, and they get free room and board throughout the winter season because they're performing those duties for the villages to keep their roads safe. It was just another little layer on there that I thought uh, would be good because we have the seasonality of it. So in addition to that, when we were writing the, the context and stuff in here for the textual information to create the visual images, we were doing it so we would engage all the players, including the DM, GM, or GO, whoever's running the event. It's to engage them all and, and connect with them all, the entire space. So like I was talking about on the previous stream on, you know, the flow and placement of the consistency to the information. Why is that there instead of here? Why do we put that first and why is that generalized so that we can build specific components on top of that general concept so they have something to stay at that, right? And if something gets specific, we make sure that there's a way that it can go back to its general concept if need be to make an alteration we give it the opportunity to change so that we can you know with the generals and the, and the supporting evidence being broken down so if we specify it the general can come back out of that easily because the general becomes part of the specific it's never forgotten right um we don't build the walls and the design doing that we keep it completely open so that all the pieces can remain in motion. Once we start putting too much in there, the pieces can't move. It disrupts the creativity because you're constantly fighting against those walls that the design keeps putting up and stops you from being able to use what's actually in the space. You know, the potential for more modular uh, design instead of just module design. Modular is motion. Module is it's here and it's stuck in the space, very specific, very railroady. To break the chains on that, to take the walls down, make it modular, you have to do a different process. And that's what we've been talking about, foundational design, right? The only thing we really do here on our channel and contingency, that's why I built it, is to build modules in that fashion. No one does it. They literally have no idea how the concept even would work for their space. So we built something very specific to handle it answer the questions right so we got all the way through it all the way down got everything done we started taking a look at some of the support structure for the space itself for the module adding in components that would allow the module to hold weight on its own and create motion within itself regardless of what the players do and take away that extra effort that the dmgm or geo would have to do mentally the strain we relieve it completely and we handle all of the components that we put in the module and the range is where they go. We handle them all within the space. We make those also modular like we did here so that they don't even have to think. They can just roll for it, right? The dice are tools and we use them as that so that they can be moved around in the space and help to create a range of stories. Like I said, last stream under the number crunch for probability, by itself it can create 144 modules from it variations and combinations of just the options that are all listed inside here in each of the different sections it can create 144 different combinations and variations that's why we didn't put any encounters in here not zero because we don't need to it will make them they just need to decide how many they want right and roll for it takes two seconds they'll know what's there they'll know everything that they need and be able to do it when i do do the finalization for the module myself and put it into a space, I'm going to use the process, clearly, to make a module from the module. And then it'll have its publication sort of piece. And I'll probably do a couple of them in there and then put it all together in one package and say, well, here's a couple of already rolled and decided upon options for the same space using all the tools that are in here. Or you can use your own, right? And you can just 
grab it and roll it up. Or just go in and select it. Say, well, I want the troll to be here. I want the troll to be there. I would like uh, the caravan to come through this way. It's all there in case. We've covered it all so they don't have to worry about it. You know, and we've created points of interest as well. Randomly, selection-wise, but at its range of what could happen in each of the locations as not only the troll moves, but the players move and outside sources between the villages and the village itself. What's happening? How are, how are those logistics moving through that space? We take care of the entirety of it. If I say that there is a caravan that comes in and they have an item on there, I'm going to list items. I'm going to list the caravan. I'm going to list who the guard is that's on top of it. I'm going to list why they're coming there. All that information is going to be in the design so that the person getting the design doesn't have to do any of that work. And then suggestively, in the same space, we will write that foundationally so they know what the components are so they don't have to go in and extract it out. We'll list those components so they can just make selections if they want to and provide them the space to make those selections clearly within the design so they don't lose track of what they're doing. Everything will be where it's supposed to be so the design continues to flow based off the design, right? Because we don't want them to lose the story in the space. There is a story there. That's what we created. There's just 144 different ways to tell the same one <laughs> in that instance. And that's without players in the space. Once we added players, it starts increasing exponentially, depending on the number of players. And then add in the measure of success and fail on top of that. The combinations start increasing, increasing, increasing. I mean, we were over, like I said, combinations for all three locations outside of the city, the city itself, the village, the main one, all the combinations of the troll success and fail, the players typically, right, based off the number of players, their measure of success and fail, all of that creates probability, can all be collected. It's nearly 60,000 different combinations for just this module. And it is a 10-point foundational troll bridge design. That's it. You can't get any simpler than that, right? And that's not the only one that we have. I built hundreds upon hundreds of these foundational designs to be able to build modules that build more modules that build more modules, right? Leading on and on and on and on. So you have to, don't have to do any work. It's done. But you can, and it's fun to play around with it. So playing the same module even isn't the same module every time because you're going to be able to roll it randomly and determine. Unless you literally selected it and ran it specifically that same combination of components, you'll dwindle the combination of probability down, but it's still going to be probable because the players have autonomy, right? So they're going to make different choices. And the dice for them is controlled by them. You don't control their dice. So their measure of success and fail comes from their range. And it could be done diceless, right? You could also do it without dice. We write our modules so that our modules have the widest range foundationally. Then we select what we want to do. Contingency has a dice-driven system. So we then write it for the dice-driven system that we have. But we know it's not just our space. We never just create for us. So we leave the foundational design there also so they have it. So they can use it in whatever space that they have. It doesn't matter what brand. The foundation allows it, because I designed it that way, allows it to be completely agnostic for anything. It doesn't matter. Any system, dice or not, DM or not, right? Obviously. Players or not, obviously. The choices can be had in the space. So the widest range, right? Contingency has the opportunity to run solo. Groups of players, you can run it. Uh, in the professional space, make it competitive. You can have it generate out the space. You can use it to write stories in the same space. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm out of fingers on one hand already. It's, it's exponential, right? And that's the idea. You want it to do the work. That's the idea of being the designer in the space. So when I pass it on to the designer in their private space, and they're using it, or in our controlled space, like our... Um, logistical space that we or normally orchestrate for us for public play access, right? Our gaming system, more or less. When we're hosting an event and we have a bunch of people there and we show them the system and get them trained up and have them run events in the event for us, right? And they're in the space. We build stuff in the space so that everybody is participating. So it's not like the DMGM or GL is doing work per se. 
we want them to be a part of that space too and be able to make decisions and give them that range. Like I said, it's not just one story to tell, right? So when we got it all done, we had the components, the things that we know, the absolutes we have to put in to support the structure we have. So we needed to make a list of village names, no problem. The caravans, cargo, what are they carrying and what would they be doing with it, right? What is the reasoning behind it? We had to give them identities for the different locations and we had to give them specific items because we had listed that as a possibility. We had to come up with a bit of festivities that were happening this time of year, right? We've got um, a range of things happening when the fall season starts to come around because winter times closes a lot of the roadways down, especially in some of the areas, here especially. Uh, we had to take a look at the village defenses and then the village maps because we've got four villages. In reality, there's actually five villages because up top we have high water, right? Or high bridge, I mean. Uh, farther down is high water is there too, but high bridge is up top. Generic names because they don't have nobles or anything like that manage in the space. It's like an equal opportunity space. There isn't anybody in charge, I guess you could say. They're just locations. So they get generalized. It's not like saying um, Vercel, right? That's specific. There's a lord there. The lord named it. it that's what it is. They have a generic name as to what they are. So High Bridge is because there's a bridge there and it's high. I mean, it's can't forget it. High Water is there because there's a huge up uh, in the mountain range. There's a huge inland, inland lake that's isolated between the peaks and stuff up there. Several of them actually, in fact, uh, on Grigor. Uh, specifically in the range closest to the waterfalls. There's quite an extensive amount of them. Kind of a lot. So... They each have unique things. There's um, uh, Maiden, which is up there, and the, the stone structure there looks like when the waterfalls are pouring through, like the Maiden is crying is what it looks like. So the module that's for that space is called Tears of the Maiden. It's talking about stuff in the space and kind of branches around on what's in that area because I already have that module wrote. It's completely off stream. It's a different one that I was working on um, last week there. But then we had to take a look at some of the other things happening, right? Like, how can we bring hints that the troll is there if we don't say that there's a troll, right? How do we bring the troll in? We can bring players in, but now how do we introduce that monster into the space? If we haven't already done so, or they're not just like, we don't say, oh, well, you're going to fight a dragon. We don't say, you're going to fight a troll, right? So in the instance, they don't know what it is. So we got to bring it into the space. So we have a lost traveler, and in the design we said that the traveler ran into the troll. And that's how they discovered the information, through the traveler, who could have wouldn't been with a caravan, that's destroyed, and they managed to get away. Or they could have just been on the road and managed to get away somehow. They didn't have anything that the troll was interested in, or maybe it ate already. Didn't care. They just took off, right? Then we also had the bodies in the river. Could be from the troll, could be for something else. Completely isolated. I put it in there because I also wanted to be able to use that as somewhere else to bring the players into another location, off of this location. If by chance the DMGM or Geo needed to put the players somewhere else after the module, they could use those hints and processes to do that. A body in the river, and you look at the body and it doesn't have any claw markings and nothing, but you flip it over and it's got a knife in it. Well, the troll didn't do that, right? That's a different situation, you know? Maybe it's riddled with arrows. They flip it over. Or they find one and it's got arrows in it. Or maybe there's like, a, you know, it's infected with something, right? they got a, a plague or some kind of a, an illness onto it. Maybe they're just missing their head and there's no thought process what did it. Could be anything, right? Maybe a gator got them, right? Floodwaters could be. Depends. Colder area, though, because it does have snow and stuff here. So, you know, where do the gators go when it starts to get cold? They get out of the area and travel somewhere else, or they hunker down and do almost like hibernation. Could be, right? We're dealing with a fantastical world. It doesn't have to be like Earth. It can be like anything that we want, right? So we can decide whatever. So with that being the case, obviously, thought process-wise, we got the troll's biology, right? Uh, what kind of a troll is this? We can build whatever we want. They can build whatever they want. And so we just took a look at the thought process as to the range of that. Like, what abilities does it have? Regeneration, what's its metabolism? 
we said it was moving around in sort of the terrain. It was almost like it was hidden, like a ghost almost. So is that an ability it has, some sort of adaptive camouflage that it can do? What? what? How does it work? What are some of the tidbits to that that they could use for inspiration to create moments in the space that they're using? We need to give them the right tools so that they can use the range of learning processes that humans have, right? We talked about that. We need the visual, we need the, the descriptive, right? We need to paint those images. We also need the tangible aspects. We need the sounds and stuff. They need to be able to utilize what works for them individually in the space so they can reach the widest audience within the space because it's diversity and inclusion all day, right? That's the only way we do what we do. It has to reach the entire space. And we have to assume nothing. We have to assume they have no previous knowledge base of anything. Even if they've been in the space for 100 years or whatever, it doesn't matter. We have to assume they know nothing. So we give it to them, all of it, right? And it's not any more work because the process requires you to look at all of it. Take a walk around the design, like I said, so that you know where everything is supposed to go and what connects to what. That is part of the job of being the designer. The industry does not do that. They have a lot of problems, and their inability to perform the basic functions of that job creates a lot of problems, DM burnout being one of it, because the DM's got to go in and do all that extensive work to extract it or create things, because the spaces aren't being designed in a way that it supports the space, right? You can't build from the space because the space isn't giving you everything you need. It definitely isn't giving it to you in the right order or sequence because it, we were on that other module. Dungeons and Dragons, one it happened to be, that was the short straw on it. It, it popped up, it's fourth edition module. It doesn't matter what edition, they're all the same on how they do it. it. doesn't matter what brand. It just happened to be one that popped up. It has some good points visually on some of the exterior concepts of how it delivers information. And then that's where it stops because by the time it gets inside, it had tools available and it didn't use them. It had things within it that it didn't use properly. And by the time we were on page six, we had 50 trolls to deal with instead of one. And they were going in all directions and there wasn't any material to support any of those directions. And it says, you can. And then you look at the design, you're like, okay, but where, how, what? They assume too much, like I said. They do that often. It's like, this is not correct in this manner this is not top tier material it has to be relooked at it and it has to be redone and what i always have to do is go in and fix it every time because if you sit down there and you try to run that from page one through there's no way you're going to go all the way to page six in the time frame that you have when you get set down on a table and the modules in front of you and you got a group of people you don't know sitting there to run in a public space you don't have the ability to go through and do prep, right? It literally prevents you from doing prep. We talked about that before on previous streams, several streams, in fact, on how that process can break down exponentially. It's self-destructing design. It's, it's no good. It's hot mess. Whereas this, even at its base that it sets here, this foundational layout of this entire module, and I'm going to go through it one more time before we start the next one, um, it already inspires the space in a way that the person who is there because of the sequence of it and what's there knows they're going to be supported with what it is they know they're going to have what they need there isn't a component that's in the design that's missed in the design if i say there's trees or a cave or there's some creature i get it all in there there isn't anything that is not there covered with the way that it works in the space so that they can use it. I look at the logistics of it and how it moves around in the space. What does it affect? What doesn't it affect? What happens if they interact with it? What happens if they don't interact with it? It's very simple. You put yourself in the position of that thing and you take a walk around. What can and can't this thing do? If it doesn't have relevance in the space, then it doesn't belong in the space. If it doesn't make sense. If it's not the troll, then it shouldn't deter focus from the space. It has to be a support structure, so it needs to function logistically like that. That's how you make the module work properly and deliver the information properly. It has a big advantage of doing that.
because then it starts to increase the capacity of what it can and can't do as a space, right? So then we had the river names and functions because we know the space divides out. The river system comes down off these falls. We got high bridge up top, high waters farther back, but we got high bridge up there. The falls drop down. They assumed the troll was dead. They did look for it, didn't find any trace of it, assumed it was gone. Didn't, didn't care, probably never sent word anywhere that they had dealt with this thing. It was just a one-off and they figured it was gone. They're like, yeah, there's no way it survived this. It's dead for sure. We don't see any sign of it. No worries. If we seen a sign of it, then maybe we would have notified someone else. Kind of concept. So they didn't care. It was taken care of and their solution was there at least temporarily. It didn't come back, obviously, because downriver it started making its nest here in this space where it was doing its hunting. So we've got the different branches of the river system and what that's going to be doing. What are the functions of it? We have some of them. I already mentioned some. We've got, you know, the, the three falls on the one section. We've got the river system that flows the other direction down to the village past it. They're using it. There's different things happening in the space. It gives it a nice range, creates good layers of immersion within it. It makes the logistics help the world to come alive. So it doesn't just seem like a flat unactive space where only a light shines where the players are now there's other things in motion you know the players in the new age because of the way that they are being instructed which we know they don't do um it it disrupts the way that the space is actually being presented that they assume everything else is on pause except for where they are that there's no possible way that something could be happening that they don't know about it's only what's happening here. So the village over there has to wait until we get there before it can do anything. It's like, no, that's not how it works. There's no worldly pause button except in a vicinity around where you guys are, right? So you guys have to look at that. And it's logistics, right? It's everything in motion all the time. So then we had the uh, locational map right at the floodwater. We needed to know what it was and the key locations around it. So we've got the bridges. We know that. There's three bridges that we have. We needed to have those. And then even deeper into it, which we expanded down, right? We've got number 12 here. What are the logistics of the roadways when the flood water isn't there? Then what happens when the flood water comes in? How does that work? What is the range of its flooding in that space? So you have the completely flooded, you have the not flooded, and then you have the range of effect between those two points, the measure, right? The bridge, basically, of that. So we looked at that, even just that logistic, in the same mentality of troll bridge, where we have the min and the max, right? We've got the, the success is the roads are dry. The fail is the roads are, are completely washed out. And then we have the range in between, which is how far does that river expand and contract every time it seasonally floods? We need to know that because depending on when they arrive in this location, it can have a range of effects. Maybe one, one location they think is fine and they're traveling through there, but it's all washed out. Whereas another location is still fine and good because the river hadn't flooded that far yet. It will eventually, but it hadn't done so. And there's a way to keep track of all that. So we needed to do some structuring with that, with the maps, right? So we needed three maps to give it a good range so they could use it. So we've got to do that. Um, uh, the stocks and resources of the village, because we know they're running low. They don't have a way to sustain themselves themselves, right? There's no food sources there. They don't have crops. They have to outsource everything with their finished goods that they have and they make. From raw materials, they also get brought in. They have physical items leaving not perishable items out to the markets and the villages and exchange for perishable items that they need because they have no way to get it without it, right and the idea was okay if they've got this coming in where are they putting it right because the troll is hungry he's out and about doing his thing he's eventually going to get in there and try to get to it right especially if it's low how much is there how little is there right we were setting the stage for that and then what are those items? What is it that they actually maintain there? What it, what could it possibly be? And, and that gives you the range by looking at that specific thing. And they're all just individual components, right? We had the herdsmen from up top um, at Highbridge 
They have those goats, right? So we have the, that entire herding sort of community space up there because their goods from there travel down to the other villages, right? Because they've got the milk. They've got the butter, they've got the cheese, right? They've got the wool and stuff basically coming from the goats that they can use to make clothing, cloaks, and, and whatever. All of that resource gets taken down and distributed out. They also have goods that they have. So they have their own issues, right, in the module, uh, the story, basically. But we turned it into a foundational module of design first and then built from it for this one. So we got the resources of trade. Where did those come from, right? We had the villages. So what location can build what? And how well does it do that thing, right? We need to know that. Because if for whatever reason, flood water fails and it's compromised in some way, the troll is going to run out of food here. If there's no one coming down here, it's going to try to find food somewhere else. So it's down at the bottom. It's going to follow one of these trade roads and get itself towards another village. That's just what it's going to do. It's a monster, right? It's going to go find what it needs to survive, right? Because I have that listed on here. Survivability for the troll. It's the thing. It needs to be looked at, right? So we also had the tradesmen and the trades. So we have individuals at Floodwater and the other locations that we need to look at in the design. Think about it. These are components within it that we need to take in make sure we know so if there's a blacksmith here what do they make what if we changed it from a blacksmith to a bread maker what do they make right at what location how does it work maybe the person just makes you know like clothing or cloaks or whatever we need to know those different components so that when the players are in the space and the dm gm or joe is in the space they know what is there so they don't have to think it's response without thought easily so then we have the merchants, the ones that are in charge of these different caravans, and obviously the trading community spaces. The merchants are the ones that are the frontline trade dealers, and we actually have a merchant's guild that we have um, to deal with as well in that same space, a merchant's guild we want to take a look at. We have the guards of the individual villages, and we have the guards of the caravans, which we were talking about briefly there, and how they travel from the village to out to the points where they say bye-bye caravan, You've got this new uh, guardsman to take you from here to here. Our escort stops here, right? And I'll make a note of that here. Um, escort, and I'll say uh, local limitation. Just to remind, because in the space we have that as well. Um, up inside the design, we mentioned how far they can go and why there's a reason for that. Then we also added in, because you know, winter time's coming, the troll's hibernation requirements. What happens to the troll when the temperatures drop and the food sources go down, right? Did it stock up enough? Has it taken things back to its den so that it can do that process, right? Does it need to or doesn't it need to? And then the troll's den itself, right? Where is this thing hibernating? It has a den somewhere. What, what is that? So we had a couple of specifics, right? We had these, and I'll scooch that up a bit. We have these other specifics to deal with. The NPC characters. We've got the village leaders from the four towns we know. We have the four different caravan guard. We have the four different village guard. Someone's in charge of each of those things. So we need to give it at least enough locked in. We put some people in some positions of power there. If not, we at least give a range of optional titlings for that. Could be anyone. And whoever they select would get plugged into the module. And once they have it there, it gets repeated in the locations and we mention it. So if I say, like in my modular designs, how I do it is, if I say select from such and such list the individual, so you get your person or come up with the name of your own. Once you plug it there, in that same space, it'll say re-referenced on page whatever, page whatever, page whatever. So they can just at that same point flip to those pages and make that same note. And the design is all slotted out, ready to go. They just go right in and make those notations, and, and they got it. So that every time that that would be repeated, they don't have to flip back. They'll flip once to the design and they have it. And each of those locations where it is listed, it will also re-reference not only where it came from, so they know um, where it is foundationally, so they can go back to the very first point it was, but then they'll also know the other connection points in which it's measured again. Where does this person pop back up? 
and why is that person there? I'll be able to go and find that. So they don't have to go, well, I don't know where that guy was. It was on such and such page. No, no. It's right on the same spot so that they can find it. It's all part of the design. It's the, the graphic layouts and things like that. It puts the person where they need to go. It is the compass in the design that moves them where they need to be so that they know what's up, right? So the caravan guard and the village guard, we have them both. We have the troll also that needs some names alternatively if it is, or at least in the instance of what is it, right? Some specifics about it so we know. We have the goat herder uh, and what their name is. And we have the goats, the three goats, because we built it from the idea that this module happens after the story Three Billy Goats Gruff, that the troll survived the fall and made its way down the river system, banging on rocks and hitting stumps and whatever, and washed out into the floodwaters, and then sort of rallied itself up because of its natural abilities. It survived, even all that, it survived. Fallen down the huge expanse to the water, and falling over the falls down into the other sections where it couldn't just come back up instantly. Because in the original story, it doesn't say that the troll comes back right away. Which would mean that there has to be some way in which it doesn't have the ability to come up. It doesn't say that it dies. And it doesn't say that they ever found it after that. So it definitely left the space in some way. There's really not a whole lot of options for that to occur. So we narrowed it down and created some hypotheticals, made some choices, which makes it nice, right? So we'll go back up to the design. We've got those different sections covered, right? We've got the different things. You know, where is the troll going? What bridge possibly could it be? Uh, if the caravan reaches the village, the caravan doesn't reach the village, right? Bodies popping up here and there. The troll is at locations or it isn't at locations. It's traveling through the woods. Every little component was taken care of because it needs to be. So fall of floodwater, right? So it says that the river system is expansive over low falls and forked paths. Under many bridges, the troll survives. That is the initial, general to specific, layered in properly. The river system is expansive over low falls and forked paths. Under many bridges, the troll survives. We lead the players from the space that they're at to the story where this takes place. We have to also move the troll in this instance because the troll existed in the previous space and we're carrying the troll over to this space. So we have to move the troll as well. It's a double path situation. Because always with whatever the design is, you have to bring the players and the designer, right, that you're passing it off to, into the space so you're all on the same page. And in order to do that, you have to look at that logistically. What gets it here? What gets them here? Now that they're here, what do they know? What don't they know? And you put that information in. We said, under another bridge, the troll regains its strength, ever thinking about the village upstream. Again, travelers pass across the bridge where beneath the troll resides. Soon, word travels of a bridge less passable and to be avoided. The village nearby posts the signs for a solution. They require the bridge for trade and travel. They have not crops of their own and trade tactile goods beyond. End statement. The space has been set up. They are in a, re a reduction of resources at a rapid rate because this, the time frame of them not being able to access those crops is very prominently happening. They won't be able to get the goods. They won't be able to store them properly. They won't make it through the winter, right? Their tactile goods need to be able to trade out or they don't have enough resources and finances to maintain the village. They would have to abandon the village and move into the other surrounding villages until winter is done and then come back to the village and try to regroup, right? So we have to make sure we make that space like that. So that being the case, that sets up the entire space. So what I wanted to do, um, we've got all of it. Everything's there. There's nothing that's missed. All the components are, are looked at. It's moving great. 
that one was using it as face value. We carried over the same original troll and bridge foreground concept. I said we were going to take a look at hiding it a bit so that the design doesn't appear as prominently in the space, which we're going to do here in this adventure number two. In adventure number three, we're going to take a look at nearly eliminating it from the space. It's still there, but we're hiding it in such a way that it's not recognizable as what it is. So it takes a bit of work to go through and pull that and, and pull that around inside the design because you have to think about what it is that you are actually doing. We're going to do it so that we've got it. Um, we're going to start with, we had a concept that we were talking about a kingdom and we said with just two target words, I said noble king was the starting point. And then I said, corrupt king. Then I said, dying king. Or traveling king. Just two words. One word is foundational, and the other word is logistical. It's pretty obvious, like I said before, which one is the logistical one. It's the one in motion. So noble traveling dying corrupt are all the logistical components that can be swapped in and out to the design king remains there in space as the foundational component so there's a king and there's a ton of different ways combination wise that he can be doing whatever it is so in this particular space and i'm going to move quickly on this one because this one's a little different so we're going to hide the same parameters within the design not completely, but enough that it's not a troll in the sense of literally. And it's not a bridge in the sense of it's an actual physical bridge. The bridge is the path, space. It's limited and focused. It moves the space very specifically. We create a bridge within the design. And it doesn't matter what module that you go to. This formula will go inside and extract it out. This is 357, expand it out to 10 because it's only one piece of it, but it expands out exponentially even further than that. 357 is the base to turn whatever it is foundational. You will have all the components you require without the players in the space. Then from seven to 10, you put the players into the space and calculate out their exponential expansion into it. Again, it's logistics, it's very simple to do. We did it yesterday, and we're going to do it again. So, in this instance, right, we have resources for a location are with measure. Same thing, troll bridge concept, right? There's resources for a location that are with the measure. So, what I'm going to say is that the Lord themselves, their forces are depleted for some reason. And they don't have enough forces to take care of what it is. There is a way to get more forces, but things have to happen. I'm going to make the king be the dying king in this instance. But they were a noble king. I'm going to combine logistical options in there. So that the space has a range, but it also gives inspiration. So, a noble king... dying. I just put key points to begin with. I, can, I always come back and expand them out, just like I did with the top. So a noble king dying. Forces are depleting. The kingdom is falling as the king loses life. And, and that's for that space. So there are resources available as where to solution this. So I thought about it earlier for a brief moment, 
and I wanted to give a couple of options, right? Because modular modules build more modules. So the king has an error, is one. There is a way to save the king for two, right? We'll say and restore his life. And then I will put also, because I like to have enough components working. So we have the generic. There's an heir to replace the king. Um, there's a way to save the king and restore his life. And then potentially, I would say, the halls of the king hold secrets beneath the city. I'll say castle because we want to make sure that we're giving it a good structure. So there's secrets beneath the castle. Not sure what they are. Uh, that must be unlocked before, and I'll put after because maybe it has to be, he has to die first. That will save the kingdom. So no king. So we have the potential that the king dies and there's an heir to replace him to continue the line. There's a way to save the king so he doesn't die. And then there's a way to still save the kingdom if the king does die, right? We've got to give all the options. We've got to give them their range. So there's a path from the problem to the solution. Okay. Path from the problem to the solution. So from the kingdom, travel, to the air is option one, because the air is not here. Option two in the same space is seek out the restorative solution to save the king. It could be anything. Delve uh, for the last one, delve into the crypts below and unlock or uncover the secrets of the kings because there's more than one here in the space previous obviously hierarchy of the kings right so there is an unknown force working against uh, unimpeded travel along the path to the solution so we know this we're creating several trolls here in this instance so from the kingdom traveling to the air so, opposing forces, not allied to the throne, wish to stop the line of kings and ascension, because that's what it is, to the throne. from the king's line. Simple as that. Nothing else. We're just setting the basics. So if we seek out the restorative solution to save the king, um, obstacles in the path to restore the king's power in the throne. contain ancient evils because we don't want it to be easy. We're, like I said, we're kicking it up a notch and hiding the design inside the module space. So we also have the delving into the crypts below. So what is the, the situation there? So um, some kings are restless in the tombs as well as that with which protects them. Because we don't know what that is, and we leave it at that. So success and fail is measured along the path itself. So uh, discovery of the forces against 
throne itself. We have the thing that can save the king's life. So the quest for the item slash object restorative. Oops. Be the guardian of it. Then we also have uh, the kings and the tombs, right? So we've got the tombs, the path. So winding crypts. Beneath the city extend further into the kingdom. And it's protected by more than just apparitions. However it is. Good enough. Care how it's spelled. Uh, success and fail is measured with the unknown force. So, we have the opposing kings or lords. We know that uh, for their success and fail. We have the trials of the quest to the island, because I'm going to put an island in this particular one, to the island and the guardian, obviously, with success and fail. And then this, uh, with the, the tombs themselves, we have uh, the secrets are kept beneath the city and the tombs remain with remain I'll say haunted by the kings of old and their caretaker we'll say because there's something down there in the tombs so unknown force remains if failure is met so we have that piece. So the unknown forces remain. So um, the fall of the king and the displacement, because they'll go after the air. Of the air, the surrounding kingdoms reign. Eventually move upon the kingdom. So there could be a battle happening, depending on how many of those other kingdoms there are. Um, if, okay, so on the quest to the island, uh, the monsters of the deep Shrouded Island. The Keeper of the Item. Failure of the Rights, we'll say. Because that makes the most sense. Okay, so the unknown force departs or is departed by measure of success. Okay, so the, I'll say treaties for peace, potentially, could be a thing. Um, uh, fall of kingdoms. And we'll also say perhaps that they aren't 
on these lands. They come from somewhere else to try to conquer them. So we'll say the raids cease in the instance thereof, and they depart. Because we want to be able to move them themselves, with or without any interaction. So then we have the location itself. If they get the item, uh, so the guardian of the item passes on more than just it in relation to the space. More than one reward for their efforts. And quests could continue as they get more stuff from that particular person. They become a person that they can use. So then in the tombs, uh, the kings reveal secrets and return to lasting slumber. The guardian departs and the tombs are once again quiet. Obviously for now, because we never know when the kings could rise up again. So, success allows the solution to be reached, clearly. No, no question there. So we know that. Duration of success, the solution is not finalized. So, option one, the heir is placed on the throne with the fall of the king. Future untold, we don't know. Secondarily, the king is restored to life. So the king is restored and the events revealed further about the king's illness as what happened, right? Another adventure from the adventure. So then you also have the last piece, which is the tombs themselves, they do their thing and they restore everything down there. They get the secrets of the tombs. So, what purpose is the secret of fallen kings? Because that leads to a completely different space. We're setting up the stage for something else elsewhere. So, like I said, these go fast when you are doing it foundationally. They're, it's literally the quickest thing you possibly can do. So we have a noble king dying. Uh, their forces are depleting. The kingdom is falling as the king loses life. I'm going to also add that um, enemies on all sides, because we've already established that. Enemies on all sides. A lost heir. And promise of life, I will also add secrets of fallen kings, which most likely is going to be the name of the module design, secret of fallen kings, because the process is repetitive. We're kind of pitching the thing is when one king falls, another king rises up in their place. Whether it's by their own bloodline, somebody taking over their kingdom, or some item bringing them back to life if something happened to them. They were injured and then they're back to, to good again. We look at the range of the logistics. So in this design, Troll Bridge is here, obviously. We took and just used it and built this module from it. Though it is hidden fairly well. There's not much of it that could show where the troll or the bridges are. They're taken very specifically and isolating them individually in their space. There's more than one troll and more than one bridge here in this instance, which is one way that you can do it. To create 
direction more finite in the space. We did that with this other module. We gave it range, but it's far more open, and the troll and the bridge are that more prominent. They weren't being specified beyond it. Here, in this, we are specifying beyond it in such a manner that we're covering it. We're taking the space and moving it around in enough motion with logistics that the players won't know that that's the space. Unless they pick a path within there. This is a multi-path sort of situation. Still three. We're talking about three Billy Goats Gruff, right? There was three possible solutions to that method. There was levels of success and failure that can happen in that story. So through Billy Goat's Gruff, there was really only one, one way that each of those different um, goats could have uh, been successful in the instance. If Daddy Goat couldn't wasn't successful, the troll would aid him and had, would have accomplished what he had been pitched from the previous two goats. They would have been telling the goat, uh, or taking the goat and delivering him to his death but telling the troll the truth in the instance, because in the module, the, the story, which I created it into a module specifically, uh, foundationally, the first goat says, I'm small and you're not going to enjoy, I'm not going to fill you up. I'm a little chicken nugget in comparison to, you know, my brother goat, who's even larger than me, who he went to go and find most likely, but couldn't find him, or he didn't care, got sidetracked. He's just a young goat, probably got sidetracked. He was just looking and seeing some grass. He was hungry. Just like the troll. They had similarities, both of them. And I'm sure in the story, what they could have done in actuality was they could have played around with it a little bit more and it would have still worked out. They could have had the goat who convinced the troll that, well, there's other goats and, and I'll get bigger. If you let me go over there and eat some grass, the next time you see me, I'll be even bigger. And I'll be even more tasty. Eat me the next time, right? And the troll had been like, oh yeah, come on over. Have some of this grass. Yeah, eat some more. You know, the um, uh, candy house mentality, right? Where the witch is there and Hansel and Gretel come in. That's the other module design. It's called Candy House. Um, one of the other quick play module designs that I have. Foundational uh, design for a modular module. Candy House takes that into account where... Whatever it is needs to be more than it is currently in order for it to be more valuable to the thing that wants it. So in their pitch, their gluttony more or less in the, in the core of it helps to buy time for them, to keep them alive long enough that they can figure out a way to escape. It's kind of like a, a trap, right? The candy house is a trap, um, but the design of the entire piece of it is to move it around. So Troll Bridge, obviously, in its design... Here, you can't see the bridge. Here, you can't see the troll directly. But when you select the space, it doesn't stop the other pieces from moving. So if I say the noble king is dying, forces are depleting, the kingdom is falling as the king loses life, and then I come down and skip everything else, I don't care about anything else in that space. That's just the first sentence. General to specific. Specific being supported by the general concepts general supporting the specific the back and forth right you can never replace general concepts with specific ones a specific concept has a general component as part of it otherwise it's not specific it becomes general and it's considered over specified and it breaks the design it doesn't work you can't run it that way so if i stop there at that piece and i go down and i peel the second layer out and I see that there are other kingdoms trying to come after the king. Well, that could be the reason why his forces are being depleted, right? Because we're constantly resupporting the general concepts. Every piece that I layered in after the general concepts and their specifics were specifics upon them resupporting their integrity, not breaking it, not taking it away either. Because they do that a lot. Dungeons and Dragons has a major problem with that. A lot of other modular designs do that too. Where they go in and take the thing back away that they just gave you.
they'll say, oh, well, such and such, there's so many of this in there, and then they turn right around and the, none of those are in there. They've been destroyed, and this happens. It's like, you just gave it to me. I didn't even get two paragraphs in, and you're already taking it back away. Again, last stream there. We, we, we dug into it, just took a peek at the first six pages. They gave it to us, and they took it away. Gave it to us, took it away. Gave it to us, took it away. And I was like, wow. Yes, you, your specific beats general is working great. <laughs> You're specifying it and absolving the general concept. And then you have to start back over with another general concept. And then you over-specify it and it removes the general concept. And you got to start back over again from the beginning. So you just wasted an entire space there because you created and destroyed everything that we have. It's like, okay, well, now we're done with that. What's left? There isn't anything. So now we have to start with something completely different. We go back to the back jacket of the module and we go, well, we lost it. It's gone. And they lose focus on it quite extensively in the module because we didn't get very far into it. And we had 50 trolls instead of one. And not all the trolls were covered in the module for their spaces. So we don't have any bridges to get to the trolls. This is all work that the DM or GM is going to have to do in that space. And they go, well, you know, DM burnout is an individual. No, it isn't. Your design creates DM burnout. Your mechanical nature of um, player uh, action economy puts the choo-choo hat and conductor hat on and takes away all the options from the players in the space. So they're only able to do certain things. They can't do anything else. So you took away their autonomy as well. You broke the design three separate times and you wonder why the person sitting there goes, okay, in the design... I don't have anything supporting these components that we know the players are going to use in that space. Action economy is a driving factor of their mechanicals. And they don't list all of the action economy components in the design in each of the points in which they're measuring it. They're not there. So now the person has to do that work too in the design because it isn't there. They're only looking at, well, just success and fail. It's like, but that's not all their action economy is. Their action economy includes all kinds of things that has measures of success and fail. Not just success and fail as an average. You have the whole range of success and fail that all those components are there. And not all those components are described in that. So now what do I do with that? So we can't do that, right? On here, if I say a noble king, he's dying. His forces are depleting. The kingdom is falling as the king loses life. I've set pacing to the design. I've applied the basic concept and generality and expanded on the specifics. I gave them the layers of what's going on and left it at that. If I move to the next piece, I don't eliminate any of these components. Every time I continue down, everything is being supported by that concept. It all relies on the existence of that concept in order for it to press forward in more detail. If at any point I put a specific in, that does not support the general concept or counters the general concept. I've made an error in the design and I have to remove it. It does not belong there because it breaks the design. It will ruin the logistics and it stops the space in motion. It's no longer modular. It's just a module and it stops at that point because it can't press forward. Now the design can't carry itself and the design is broken. It has to be jump-started in some way, and 99% of the time, that information isn't in that section where they just broke it, because they took it away, right? And they don't go back, because they forget, and the thing they try to go back to get, they've already destroyed it three times over, so there's no way to go back. It's been atomized at this point. There isn't any pieces of it that can be saved. So a new concept has to be created, which is usually what happens. They make another concept in there that you now have to keep track of that and it's a logistical nightmare because of all the different directions in which it's going without measure properly so in here like i said there's enemies on all sides there's a lost air and there's the promise of life same thing that we go into detail and support constantly through the rest of the space the secrets of fallen kings that's the back jacket straightforward as it can be Obviously, we can add other things to it if we wanted to, as long as they maintain the process. But that's good enough. It doesn't need anything else. So the king has an heir. We've said this already. 
There is a way to save the king and restore his life. We've also said that. The halls of the king hold secrets beneath the castle that must be unlocked, before or after, that will save the kingdom. We've also said that as well. So in any way, shape, or form, when a king dies, there's a way to save the kingdom. Whether or not it's through means to restore the king, defeat the threats upon the kingdom in order for the heir to take the throne, or without the king, without the heir, the kingdom can still be saved by finding another person to replace that bloodline in the throne, right? We've got options. We like to keep options because it builds more modules that way, exponentially. In this instance, we have nine possible combinations in which this can go already, probability-wise. And we're only on the second piece. So then we continue. And this is without players. This is just the story itself carrying itself. This is without the measure of success and fail with the number of players participating in the space. We didn't get that far down in the, in the specifics here yet to get that measure into the equation. We haven't measured in the success and fail of the opposition either. The other individuals in the space are not being factored in as well. So we didn't take the measure of success and fail for any of the things outside yet, but we do. So the kingdom, right? Travel to the air, right? From the kingdom. Off you go, find the air. The kingdom isn't the only person looking for the air and once somebody knows the king has an air, danger is upon them. They could be doing nothing and have no idea that the father is on a downfall. They don't know that. Or maybe they do, right? We're adding even more probability and expansion to the space by leaving that foundational. We're allowing us to create and them to create in the space. We're not chaining them down. So we can seek out the restorative solution, right, to save the king. We can do that. We can leave the kingdom and go and find whatever it is that will save the king's life. It's a huge range. There's lots of options there. We're building it foundationally, so we know we have a range. We can cover that range very easily. No problem. So we can delve into the crypts below and unlock and uncover the secrets of the kings, right? We know that. The secrets of the kings is another way to save the kingdom should the heir and the king die. If both of them are unable to be reached or saved and put into the throne in some fashion... There is another way without that bloodline to still save the kingdom. We've gave them the measure of success and fail in their extremes in the instance thereof. We're using 357 mechanical operations and design processes developed here for contingency, right? To make that happen to that point. When we expand out to five, these next two, we're starting to layer in the other probabilities. The things that are happening. We're building the bridge between the problems and the solutions. We have the problems. We have the, the anticipation of the solutions. And now we have to build the bridge. We have to move the things accordingly by creating the logistics that makes it happen. We have to be more specific. Supporting the general concepts in order to maintain what we've already put in motion. Otherwise we kill it. And then we have to start over. And we don't want to do that. So we have opposing forces not allied to the throne wish to stop the line of kings and ascension to the throne from the king's line. Because we got to make sure this is the heir. We don't want them to just not have kings anywhere in the whole space because then those individuals will be going all over the place. I don't want them going all over the place. I want them focused too. So I want them specifically targeting this line of kings. Not all the line of kings. Just this one, the measure thereof. Pausing there in the instance of that, I'm going to come down and I'm going to add a tidbit in. They'll move upon the kingdom or other kingdoms to remove other kings. Tidbit. We'll go back. Like I said, the design builds more things. One module builds more modules. So we add the other component in. So, delving into the crypts, right? We've got that as well. So in the instance of, we've got obstacles in the path of the, uh, to restore the king's power in the throne contains ancient evils. So we have an object. We're, we're going to save the king's life. 
The players are going to embark on a quest to make that happen. There are things between them and the item that's going to be causing problems. But this king and his line is ancient. So in opposition of that equal measure, the evil also must be ancient. It must be something old enough to be in, in opposition to that. A thing that can do things outside of that space. An untouchable in this instance. So this particular troll would not be a troll that the players are going to be able to, we'll say, disband directly. And I'll make a note here as well. Uh, the ancient evil is out of reach directly. But it's, we'll say, conduits manifest between the players and the solution. So that we give it enough where it is a danger, others will know about it, and it has the ability to put things, could be anything. Because we don't want to just isolate it down too far. We want to keep it wide. We want to give them the option to build in the space too. It's not just our space, it's their space too. They got to be able to create in the space too. We got to give them room to do that. Got to give them the tools to do that, right? And we'll, we're going to get to that. So, the tomb beneath the castle, right? Some kings are restless in the tombs as well as they with which, right, protects them. So they're down there by themselves in their tomb. There's something else down there with them. Something else is also restless. I'm going to make a note here, and I will say restless because a king is dying, right? They are, their line is about to end. And they can sense it. Enough to rouse them from their eternal, well, we'll just say s s slumber. Because they are in the tombs. We won't have to put any kind of religious aspect there, eliminate that completely, because it could just mean nothing. So we don't have to press it in. We can keep it out. It doesn't have to be there. So they can sense it enough to rouse them from their slumber. Um, okay. So the Guardian... is there because the kings have risen from their sleep. So it's either there, I mean, we'll make the note of it, we might as well. Guardian is either keeping them in or preparing to let them out. Perhaps the Guardian is seeking something. Maybe it's looking for a new king. Because that can happen too. So, give it its range, right? So, discovery of the forces against the throne, which we know, we've established it. So, the players are able to discover who it is and make some actionable uh, things logistically happen against those things. Uh, the quest for the item or object restorative um, uh, and the guardian, right, of it. Both things. Uh, and, and that is the island. Which I'll make a note. The island, as we know what it is. The winding crypts beneath the city extend further into the kingdom and is protected by more than just apparitions. The Guardian is equally powerful. 
and I'll say beyond measure. And I will also say limited because there is a range to what they could be. So they could be equally powerful to the player group. They could be beyond the reach of the players themselves, or they could be limited, maybe duration. I'll say limited in power or duration. Could be tied to something. As the king fails, I'll say, uh, I'll make note of that here, additionally to that, as the king's life slips, the power could wane equally, like that, because obviously we're talking about connection. This thing is there for some reason. Guardian could be anything. I have some ideas already. Uh, I was thinking about it earlier. So opposing kings and lords, success and fail, right? We have those different kingdoms, and then what do they do? But we have to measure between them. Because we've got the heir that may make war against the kingdoms. Perhaps the other the players rally the heir, um, which I'll make a note. Um, players rally the heir and assemble opposition to protect the kingdom from its enemies. Right? Because that's an option. Perhaps their interaction and their, their battle is with that, right? Or uh, the players may identify, which sometimes is hidden, or protect, even save the heir from death, right? Because something could be coming after them. So we have to measure it in, in that way. So the trials of the quest to the island, which we already established, and the guardian. Um, so we have that piece. Uh, so the guardian, the island itself. Uh, so on the island, the island is a maze of tunnels and towers. And the guardian is less than welcoming. I will also put, unless the players have the secret of kings, then they're allowed to get in. It's the bridge between the two offsets. So we have multiple bridges, and we've built a bridge between the two oppositions. We have the kingdom under attack, and we have the kingdom with no heir and no king. And in between that space, the information from that and the ability to save the king or the heir and maintain the kingdom's bloodline, the guardian has to have the information in order for that to happen, to activate the item, perhaps. There's a way to make it do that. So we might as well use it, right? So then the secrets uh, are kept beneath the city and the tombs remain haunted by the kings of old and their caretaker. Um, their span... I'll say their capacity is limited by the life of the king and strength of the heir. Because we don't want it to just be tied to one or the other. So the heir is direct descendant bloodline, we'll say, and we might as well tie that to it. Because then all three things are weighing up. We, we bring the focus. We built the bridges. Right? They're in place. So, with the fall of the king and the displacement of the heir, the surrounding kingdoms reign and eventually move upon the kingdom or other kingdoms to remove other kings. Fully expanded out. Perfect. We've covered all aspects of the range of failure in that instance. Because seven is make sure that the solidified and that the weight of success and fail is clearly established. So, the monsters of the deep, uh, the shrouded isle, uh, island, and the keeper of the item... Uh, the failure of the rights itself. So, we have everything there we need. That's from the keeper of the island itself. So now we have the tombs beneath. 
So the, the tombs house scriptures, items, and things of historical weight that shifts the balance of power and maintains the capacity of whom sets upon the throne of kings. Because we want to make sure we've established it completely. So, Regilia possibly. Or Tome, potentially. Or mentor, perhaps. Merlin-esque sort of concept, right? It's nice to tie some other components into the same space. So we have treaties for peace, right? We've got that. Uh, fall of the kingdoms. Raids cease and they depart. All covered in the same thing. No problem. Full range covered. Everything is, is there. The guardian of the item passes on more than just it in relation to the space, obviously. Uh, more than one reward for their efforts and quests could continue. There could be a thing that they may be able to do. So I will put um, empty thrones, empty thrones, forgotten treasures, corrupt kings. Because this person is sort of like the one that would say, this is a king, this isn't a king, kind of thing. Might be the one that actually the kings have to go to in order to get the blessing thereof. So I might even put that, corrupt kings, uh, the blessing, I'll, I'll mention that, the blessing of the guardian in order to become king. Otherwise, you're not a true king, right? Kind of thing. I'll just put that one true king, right, in that instance. Uh, so the kings reveal the secrets and return to lasting slumber. The guardian departs and the tombs are once again quiet for now. Secrets of fallen kings. So that we don't forget that piece. Uh, okay, so then we have um, success allows the solution to be reached. Simple as that. The kingdom is saved. And its future is now in the hands of the king, whoever it is. Could be anyone. Don't know. That is the offshoot of it. Uh, the heir is placed on the throne with the fall of the king. Uh, future is untold. We have the king is restored and the events revealed further about the king's illness. So future threads, we'll say. And then what, pers what purpose is the secret of fallen kings? Uh, and we'll say who resides on the throne of the king of kings, right? In that instance. So, that measured out. We got everything we need there. So, randomization of it. We know we have the dice to operate with. They are tools. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to list like this. Dice as tools, right? This just makes it easier. And then we also have... Uh, Necessary components and specific NPCs. And specific NPCs. And that's basically the, the expansion point out from the space. Because you can't do it without it. So expanding from the location with the dice. So I'm going to list them, not assigning them to dice this time. I'm just going to list the components and then we can give them the range 
uh, when we set down. Because we're going to take each of these modules later on in another stream and flesh them all the way out on the quick play sheets, just like we did with the other ones, assign them some the values and give them the full range. But we're getting the foundational. This is the foundational. This is what I do for every single module. There isn't a, one that I don't go through and address all the logistics in the same fashion and make a modular module. This is just the way that it works to make it happen using 357, expanding it out, right? So the dice as tools. We have the range. So we have the opposing kingdoms. Um, we will have the air, right? That we need to know some information about. Air location. I'll just say air information because there's a range. And we'll say location. Um status what's the deal um capacity are they good enough to rule or not right we don't know because it's a good range so then we have um uh we we keep the kingdoms we'll put um the opposing kingdoms military presence. We don't know how many opposing kingdoms there are, so I won't be specific in limiting that. It could be anything. It could be one, could be a hundred, whatever. Whatever the space happens to be. Again, logistics and the probability will increase depending on the range. It could be any. Um, we will have the item for the quest. And I will list its abilities, its ability and requirements, right? Because we need to have all of that in the space. Um, we have the guardian judgment at the item. We also have the, uh, we'll have the map of the kingdom map of the kingdoms, because we have all of them. We might as well map them all. Quite a few, potentially, so we might as well throw some in there. Um, we have the... I'll do three kingdoms in the instance thereof. Three surrounding, right? That way we've got enough. And we have the main kingdom. So we'll have those four maps. That way we're covering it, because we've got Billy Goat's Gruff, and it deals with three, so we'll put three in there. And that fits the world of um, Rickor well, too, limiting ourselves to that. And it gives it, you know, there's the components. Minimum is three to keep motion going. You could put one kingdom, but you're setting a, li a limited duration. It doesn't provide future. If that thing's taken care of, then that's kind of it for this decent, it's a decent span of time that that's resolved. If you put more than one, then that increases the logistical range of the space. It gives you more space to look at. Anyways, we got the map of the kingdoms. Um, we have the map of the island. Um, we also have the requirements of the quest. Locations along the quest. Those are all bridge design work. Quest is the bridge. The island is the troll in that instance. When you get there, you're dealing with a compounding situation. Um, you know, the guardian of it. So uh, if we got the map of the island, we have the location of the quest, we have travel to the island. How, how do they get there, right? Some different ways you can do it, really cool things that you could do. So then we have the crypts below. So we have to do the crypts. We have to do the map of the crypts. Um, we have the kings in the tomb. We have the guardian of the tomb. Because they have information and stuff about them. If we have to specify anything else beyond that, it'll go under specific NPCs which we're obviously going to re-reference them there. So we have the Guardian of the Tombs. Um, we have optional... Or I'll put um, the secret 
of fallen kings, right? What is that whole piece? What is it? What is it comprised of? What is its capacity, right? So the whole thing. And then we also have uh, the throne room for events transpiring after. We'll put the map, of course. So we have that, because that will be a thing. Um, we have the the market square of the kingdom all of them most likely so we can get in we'll have the guards and traffic in and out of each kingdom we know that there's four total so i'll just put four here because we'll need to know what that is um because if they travel to the different ones looking or doing whatever we'll have to know Maybe the heir is allied with a different kingdom, right? And they're going to be turned corrupt. Could be. The heir doesn't have to be for it. Be like, I don't like him. I'm going to... Can't wait till he's gone, and then I'm going to storm in and take the throne and turn the kingdom the way that I want. We've had that, right? So we will put in there motivations of the heir. We also have the motivations of the kingdoms. And we have the motivations, fallen kings. Um, we already have the requirements of the quest and the judgment of the guardian there. Secret of fallen kings is tied with the guardian, which I'll mention. Well, we have the guardian of the tombs. So I'll put that there. I'll put motivation as well, because obviously they're in there. Secrets of the Fallen Kings, I'll put their motivation as well in that same space, and I'll eliminate it from here. Uh, motivations of the Kingdoms, I'll put loyalties and allies, because they could seek out allies to try to maintain the Kingdom as well. Um, I'll just put positional powers, C, specific NPCs, because there's going to be a range. So necessary components, which we know that we have to have. So we have the item. Got to have it. That's a necessity. We need to know that. We have maps specifically. So we have four kingdom maps. We have military, so we have the armies. Army, uh, I'll put four kingdom forces. Roster, so we know. And leaders, specifically. Might as well just put them straight with it. And then on the leaders part, I'll put C, specific NPCs. Because we're going to have to address that. Um, the island. I'll just put history. Because we're going to need more than just the map in that instant. It is a component that would need more things. And I know a bit about the space, so we can pull that in. And we're going to need um, uh, the modes of travel across the space. How are they getting around? What, what are some of the options that they have? That peels out of that requirements for what they already have. We also need to know, um, let's see. I'll say the the I'll say what is known about the air. You know, are they for the kingdom or against it? Because you know, they have motivations, obviously. But who else knows that? 
not just their self-driven, but what about other people? Like this, who knows? Maybe somebody knows that. That could be a thing. That could be uh, veering the path logistically that direction. So we know the crypts. So um, I'll put requirements of the crypts and their line duration, because how far back does that go? Their line duration in history, perhaps, because it isn't just a matter of, like we said here, the kings, like who are they? You know, and who's the guardian in that instance? Crips are there, and we have the kings, we have the guardian's motivation, we have the secret of the fallen king's motivation, and we have the, the king's themselves motivation. I'll add that. Um, the motivation of the space has weight, so we have to be careful with that. So the requirements of the crypts and their line in history, because it's going to be expansive a little bit. So we want to make sure we know that we're at least looking at that and addressing it. In the space, when we do the module, obviously, this is the foundational. Foundational doesn't take as long as it does to do the entire module. It's much faster to build it this way, and then this is what builds the module. This is what they need to be doing for the first piece of every single one of their spaces. The reason why is because their space constantly um, undoes what it has done every time. And that creates a problem because it's broken before you even get inside of it further. It doesn't help you. It creates a lot of work. So the specific NPCs, um, I'm going to put... For the crown, right? We need to know some. Against the crown, we need to know some. These are just range. We have the market square that has people in there. We need to know some range of people. It could be completely random, just whatever. But at least we provide the information within it. We need to do that because that's our job. Um, I will say who created the item, right? or where the item was created. That is information that's outside of just the item itself. It's something else specific. Somebody made it. Somebody got it. Who, who was it? Where does that history fall to? Um, I would say the keeper of the histories of the kingdom is an important person because they would know the bloodlines and the air itself. And the ties between kingdoms, new and old, because they don't mess around with that. So a kingdom who's doing something he shouldn't be doing or, or she shouldn't be doing, this person knows that and they're going to say, hey, no, remember. This is your kingdom owes this. You can't be doing that. That would be an act of war, and this ends the um, validity of you being who you are. You would forfeit your kingdom, right? Uh, and I'll mention that. Um, forfeit the kingdom required allegiances. And fallen allies because what happens when they don't have someone so that is tidbit that has to be in there as well so besides that crypts the tomb players move through the space you have the guards that's no problem all covered motivations the air the kingdoms the NPCs so who else would be important we have the king current And direct, I'll say, direct care of the king. Could be anyone, whoever's directly there around them. Um, king, that's why it does that. Um, direct care 
of the king. And it could be for or against, right? Because there could be a range of people who are right there next to him and they're like, they could, they're just waiting for the pillow, you know? They're like, oh, no one else is in here? Eat pillow, king. And off the king goes, right? Off the king. And, and then they just go, oh, the, the king, is, is, he's dead. And you're like, oh no, I just left here. I thought he was alive. And they assume that this person's an ally, right? Um, I'll mention allies close and enemies closer. So they so that address that piece, not to forget it. So that covers the logistics of that. There isn't a piece that's missed. So let's go back up. So vice has tools. We're gonna have to make some randomization capacity for opposing kingdoms. So they've got a range to select from. It could be anything. As long as they're covered in the space. We need to get the information about the air itself. That's part of the process. Things that are really required for the foundational design, right? Uh, the location, the status, the capacity of this person to be the heir for the kingdom. We have the opposing kingdom's military presence, right? We need to know who has what, why, how, all that. We need to know the item that's for the quest, its abilities and its requirements, whatever they happen to be. Uh, the Guardian's judgment at uh, the item itself, because obviously they can't get the item unless they're deemed worthy. We've got the map of the kingdoms. We have the three surrounding ones and the main kingdom, all the components that are in motion. We've got the map of the islands, the requirements of the quest, uh, the locations along the quest. There's going to be some different key locations. And I will put here and their challenges because that will be a thing that's part of that. Requirements of the crest, and I'll just put overall here because it's two separate categories because you're going to start with the general and then you're going to go to the specifics. Each location would have something else. Then there's the mode of travel back and forth to the island. So we have the map of the island and we also have travel to and from the island because they have to get from the mainland to the island and from the island back to the mainland. Whether or not the item has the capacity to just instantly move them or not, that's, you know, up to the space. So I'll put um, item, question, um, alternative, movement, to how they arrive, perhaps, right? I'll just put arrived option. That way we've got it, just in case, because I mean, it's there, thought process. But we've got a map of the crypts, um, the kings in the tomb, what's their motivation? The guardian in the tomb, what's their motivation? And the secret of fallen kings, what's that motivation, right? Uh, throne room, we've got the map. Market square of the kingdoms, because we're going to need that. And I might as well put four here, because there are four. Uh, throne room, map, might as well just put four here too. Because what if they go and talk to the other lords and be like, hey, don't attack this kingdom. Don't be dumb. That could be a thing, right? Uh, so the market square of the kingdoms, right? And I'll put that also as map. The guards and traffic in and out of the kingdom, there will be four of those also with their lists of information. And we'll try to make them so that they could be um, randomized in the instance of. Perhaps the guards are on patrol, and what we'll do is I'll, I'll mention it here. I'll put patrols, which we can randomize with dice. We can use the dice as tools and randomize the patrols of the traffic. Uh, we can randomize, um, we'll say, the populace's it's motion, right? In and out of the kingdoms, because both things can be manipulated properly in and out of the different kingdoms, right? Uh, and I'll put... I'll put this, local or outside populace. Because it's not just the people who are there. There could be a visitor, right? And I'll put that. Visitor unknown, maybe. Maybe somebody is in there off the king, right? Uh, you had the motivations of the air itself. What is the air going to do? Is the air good, bad, on the fence? We don't know. We leave it open, right? It's logistical. It's modular so that they have some options. We give them the widest range before we pick the space for ourselves, right? 
So motivations of the kingdoms, we need to know that. Loyalties and allies of the kingdoms, right? And then positional powers, specific NPCs, like who's in power at these different locations. So necessary components, we know we need to have the item. That is no question. We need to know what that item is that can bring the king back to life, potentially. We have the four kingdom maps. We got to have it. And the reason why is we need to know the kingdom's forces and their roster. We need to know the leaders, specifically as NPC characters. We need to know what they're working with and how that power can change the space itself its logistics just as it sets in motion or not right because we need to know are they on the move or are they not moving yet because you could have forces making their way to the kingdom assuming the king's going to die you could have forces that are not moving to the kingdom waiting for news that the king has died you could have forces that will do that but they're waiting until after they do all the pleasantries and then they're like, oh, well, the king's gone. We've done our pleasantries. We're going to just be, well, is it thrown up? Maybe we should be the king, blah, blah, blah. We're trying to be nice. But then when it doesn't happen, they go, you know, ba -do -do -do. and then the whole army comes in and they're like, well, if we can't get it the nice way, we'll just do it the other way, right? And they do that. That's what happens. So the range of that creates massive combinations in the, in the probability of logistics, right? The history of the island itself, where the item is, right? Item is, and how it came to be there or exist, right? Because we want to cover that range of that. We have modes of travel across the space. How are the people getting around, you know? Like in that Dungeons and Dragons module, it doesn't list any modes of transportation inside there. They just put a key on the map. And it's like, it's five days travel. Six days, really, with five nights. Because in order to travel properly across the space without getting jacked, because you're going to have to make stops in there in some way, you're either double timing it and running at night, which is risky because there's a lot of things moving around. You'll run into stuff. Or you'll get robbed from the bandits on the road because they had bandits there. And they didn't put all that in logistically properly that it creates even more delays to get to the space. Because the space itself has its own timeline. And it's like they kept exponentially increasing from the 50 freaking trolls they put into the module uh, because they lost focus. Like They had squirrel mentality as soon as they got into the module. It just went bad all of a sudden. So in their module, the pacing to get to the place when you first move in as soon as the logistics start where you would have to be moving, they immediately just start delaying and delaying and delaying and delaying and delaying the space. So it's just one thing after another that they don't make it to that space. It makes it almost impossible because by the time you get through it, instead of being able to run the module in a couple of hours, which is what it's pitching initially, that it's a couple of hours to run through the module. You're talking about it could be a month, maybe longer, depending on how many times you have to go through it because you're not going to get through the space. It's going to be one hell of a duration. It's almost like a campaign setting module because on its own, the space just keeps putting more things in front of you so you can't just travel to get to it. Now, you could say, oh, you just travel from here to here, but that completely just throws the entire logistics in the toilet. It throws it in the garbage because they can't just get from there to there without something happening because the space isn't designed for them to do that. So like I said, they didn't look at how it's connected. It's a hot mess. We're going to get into it. It's going to be probably tomorrow that we'll deep dive into it. So I want to be able to, to get these done. But it, it is a thing. You have to look at the components of your space. Obviously, we're doing that here. Make sure we got it all covered. Because as you move a piece, another piece is also moving. It's just the nature of the beast. You create opposition in the space. It's not whatever you want. There's no nothing there. That's not very heroic, right? There isn't no measure of success and fail. There's just success in the space like that. So in that instance, you might as well just write a book because it's success the whole way. Just like if you go through and it's failure the whole way, well, then write a book. And it's, you know, not a great one because the heroes don't win the day, right, in the end. So awfully depressing, I guess you could say, or you're like, crap, I like that guy. It's Game of Thrones when you got the person you like, and in the end, the person dies, and you're like, well, that sucks. That writer likes to do that. Kill all the heroes, 
And then in the end, you got one person standing there. You're like, how'd this guy get here? <laughs> you know? So you have to make sure, like in here, right? We've got a king. He's dying on the, on the throne. Something happened, caused him to be fighting for his life. And the thing that happened, we don't know. That is the thing. So in here, we have to put um, why or how is the king dying? What happened? What caused this event? We'll say item, perhaps, something you got into contact with. Monster, perhaps. Magic, could be anything. There's a range. I'm just going to give a couple in there just to remind. Crucial component because we need to know that. Why is the king dying to begin with? Is it old? Right? I'll put age, just because we can. Perhaps. Could be. Could just be the end. Sometimes that happens. So... Once we know how they get across that space, we need to know what is the deal with this heir. The king is here in the kingdom and the heir is somewhere else. So why is the heir separate from the kingdom space? Is there a reason for that? Maybe because he didn't have his power yet in the kingdom, right? Because that happens. He doesn't have power in the kingdom yet. So... He's somewhere else waiting for the king to pass the power along at which he returns. So there's no competitive nature in the space between, well, I'm saying what happens here, and it's like, well, I'm also an heir of the line. If I say something, how much weight does that have in the space? None? Well, then what am I doing here, right? I'll go somewhere else where my, my say has more say in that instance, right? The heir could be Positioned there specifically by the code of kings, potentially. Or the heir is their bratty syndrome, right? They want to be on the throne, but they're not. And they throw a fit, so they take off, right? Hissy fit. So in the instance thereof, also, you have the potential that the king sent the heir away. Maybe to protect them, right? Could be. So the heir is there because they're being protected. So that the king doesn't have someone threatening and going, well, we'll end your line. We'll find the heir and kill it, so that ends that. Then we'll go after the king after. If they assume it's just the king, they might pace things out differently, assuming that the king will get to age and we'll just buy our time until there's nothing. He has no heir. When his, when his line is done, that's it. Not knowing that he has an heir hidden somewhere else. Kings used to do that a lot, because then they're their throne was always absolute. Their bloodline would always be on the on the throne. They would hide heirs. They'd have multiple um, pairings with counterparts in order to spread the bloodline as far as they could. They would do that for a reason. Sometimes they would do that in secret because they wanted to make sure that person was rose outside of that space to keep corruption from getting into them, to maintain the beliefs that they thought they would find someone else to house and raise the person under those beliefs so they would become better or optimal, we'll say. That happens a lot, right? They move them somewhere for safety. So, tidbit of that little information. So, I put for or against from the perspective of others here, but I'm also going to add in um, protection of the line. Um... I will put infusion of, let's see, honor, I guess we could say, beliefs. Protect from corruption. We have protection literally longevity would be the word for that. And protection from corruption would be the alternative as well. So that way it covers the range of that. So I put for or against from the perspective of others. Protection uh, of the line's longevity, infusion of honor or beliefs, or protection from the corruption. All possible options. You know, what's the deal with this air? What do we know? Um, 
Yeah, for or against from the perspective of others. So it's covered there in case someone else is against that. They could be. Um, they could have taken the child and, and put it outside of that and replaced the child with something else. Be like, well, that's not the actual true heir. They do that too. I'll put I'll put that in. I'll put um, um, unknown heir or hidden also in there because sometimes that happens too. The king doesn't know that they had an heir. They keep it hidden and they wait. That way, when the king's gone, in case the king is corrupt, because could be. If the king is corrupt, and they didn't want that child to follow suit, but the line of kings has the potential to rule, they could raise the child in the optimal way that the space needs. The king dies, legitimate heirs proven, they take the throne and they don't have the same beliefs as the previous king. Kingdom rises out of its darkness, right? So to promote that space proper. So the requirements of the crypts, because we have that, how do they get in and out of it, right? And their line duration in history, because we need to know how old the crypts are. So I'll just put age of the crypts. Because I don't, we don't know, you know, how far back does it go? So the age of the crypts and constructed by whom? Because who made them? Because that's also a thing that's always a given, like, how are they built? What was the decision making for that, right? Was it the king of that age did it? You know, like the pharaohs did when they were building all of their tombs and stuff. They supervised the construction of all of their locations. I want this here. I want that there. When I'm gone, this goes here. When I'm gone, that goes there. It's almost like they're moving in, right? And But they're planning on moving in when they're dead. So it's a huge difference in, in the process. So why and how is the king dying? Because we needed to know that. It's right on the top of the list. What the heck happened to this king caused him to die? It's a, ne a necessary feature. So when we go to the specific NPCs, we need to know for the crown, right? Who is up for the crown? And who is against the crown, right? Whoever these people are, we need to know who they are. Could be completely randomized, and it will be. Right, so they could just choose, and wherever those instances are, like I said, if I say Jim in this one location is allied with the king, underneath that space, I will say Jim appears, page whatever, location whatever. So it can all be triangulated and relocated in the design. So if they choose Jim, then all instances of where Jim needs to go, they'll know where that has to be plugged in. It'll tell them Jim goes here. And when they move from there to the next space where Jim goes, and really they only just need to go to the next one, mark it. That's good enough. There's where Jim goes. The next time in that space, it will tell them from that spot where the next reference is in the design. So they can always backtrack forwards and backwards, right? Like I always say, forwards, backwards, inside out, upside down. Navigation through the design itself needs to be referenced properly so that they know where everything is. Modular designs like this allow components to move in and out of the design very freely. So it doesn't matter who the king is. It doesn't matter who the guardian is. None of that stuff is relevant. The story is still being told. It still has its place. In the end, I can still take and go through and choose those from my list or create something completely outside of that. I've laid the options and suggestions there enough for them, and I repeat the design as if I was going through the design by using it to create the module from the foundational module. Every module that we built for the world of Gricor comes from a foundational module, first and foremost. That way the logistics are always covered. There's nothing counterdicting something else. And we keep the space in motion and expanding in all directions because we don't just build modules for ourselves, like I said. So we know that if we write a module and it's a finished published module and we put it down, that that space is gonna be in somebody else's space. Once it's handed off, it could be anything. It does not have to stick to the script in that instance. But if it's wrote as a module, instead of a modular module, then work has to be done. Prep has to be done ahead of time or during the space quite extensively to the point where it creates DM burnout, which is the broken system that they use right now, where everything in the module that they created isn't foundational, like I said, like we do in here. This prevents that from happening completely. All of the components are already covered. 
they're already setting at the table. I could have no king decided. The players set down, the DM, GM, or Geo sets down, they look at the module, and the first decision they'll make is, who is this king? And it will be referenced through the entire design. They can do it the moment they start playing without zero, they would have zero prep, but in the design it would have consistency and it supports the design constantly through it so that it doesn't seem like they are doing it while they're playing. That the moment they would say the thing, it's in the location where it's supposed to be. The communication process is happening when it needs to be communicated in layers. So they're learning the space as equally as the players are, which keeps everyone engaged. There's no robot mentality. There's no Choo Choo Express. There's no burnout. All three of those unwanted components are moved out of the space by eliminating the components in the space, in the design process that caused those problems. Just get them out of there. Action um, economy, garbage. Get it out of there. We replace it with action logistics, which is what this is. Logistics connects the space completely. Action economy adds another layer that's already being taken care of in the space. Spells say if you can move or you can't when you're casting it. Swords require motion in the space, or they don't. It depends on what you're using, but it says it already in there. So you don't have to say, well, you can swing your sword here and you can make your attack for your combat. That's it. You can cast your, you can cast a spell. You can uh, uh, move your character from here to here. What? Who gives a crap about that? It's already restricted in the character space previously to getting into the space that they're having actions happen. They should be able to just have their actions because what happens is that turns into a checklist. It pulls them back out of immersion. It separates the immersion and puts you into the space as a camera view, more or less, perspective. You're not in the character because you're being pulled out. Why? Because you're not in the foregrounds. The player is not in the foregrounds. The mechanics get pushed to the front, and that's what you're dealing with is the mechanical nature of it. And it's very limited, and every person is doing the same thing. The only way that that works well, like we talked about last stream, is in RPGA-style events where limitation is required and regular event events, not public space events and not publication to public space, whatever. Only in those two spaces does it work. RPGA where every person has equal measure because players will try to metagame and OP design stuff. They'll try and break it all the time. So by limiting it inside there and providing those components, you focus everything down tight so that they have to make specific decisions for success and fail. The measure of success and fail, because it's a competitive space, not a combined space in that instance. So the players aren't necessarily working together as a team, though they could. Their measure in those spaces is individualized, not as a collective. When you move into another space and they're working collectively, that measure was never addressed properly. It's broken every time. Even like, uh, like that module, right? So we have another module that we're going to take a look at later on also from Dungeons & Dragons also, because I used to run D&D Encounters. Uh, expeditions, epics, there was a whole thing uh, until it was Adventurers League after that. I ran everything from the before it was even called any of those. I was running RPGA stuff too. So I know how each space operates, and it's a wide range. You've got thousands and thousands of players. I mean, I wrote myself over 40,000 modules. So, I mean, come on now. It's been doing this for quite a while. In that space, when you change the way that those logistics move, you change the way those actions operate, you're adjusting the pacing of that space. You're taking away power, and you're taking away the immersion. You're putting the mechanics in the front. Why are you doing that in that space? Is because you're trying to showcase certain features. The idea was to promote and, and display things. It was their attempt at also doing a measure of what I would consider repetition in replace of instruction. They figured by going through the routine sequence over and over and over again like that piece of it, it would be instruction by itself. 
because there was never instruction as to why those things were in that sequence or why they were measured in that way. There was nothing. They just call it the rules, and they think rules are instruction, which they're not. Rules are rules. Instruction is instruction. Instruct how to use the rules, because rules can change from table to table. They can make adjustments to it. It's not locked in stone. And then you know which ones are part that they can, and which ones are ones that if they mess with, breaks the design completely, and they can't. So that they understand what it is that they're messing with. If they remove a component, what does that do to the design? It's not in there explaining any of that because it's not instructional, right? In here, when we do it, we assume nothing. No one knows anything. We start from the beginning. The modules are the same. The modules begin with general concepts and expand to specific ones, constantly supporting the general concepts. They have a completely opposite approach to it because they don't understand it. When they sit there and preach their thing, specific beats general, they sound like an idiot. Because they're literally like, we, they might as well just say, we break every design we make. Because that's exactly what it is when they say that. Because they're going to give you something or put something there and then rip it right back down in the design. Because they're not supporting it in the design. That's why they have mechanical problems. That's why they have modular logistical problems. And that's why a DM's brain is on fire the half the time. In doing prep because they have to extract things and move things all over the place because the design isn't helping them do that process. A lot of times it's preventing it. And even if they do do the process and they manage to go, okay, well, if I move this, okay, I think I got it. The design's gonna come right back around and go, nope, and yank the rug right out underneath them and back down they go. By the time you're done, you feel like you've been in an epic battle and you're the only person standing there. Your sword's broke, your shield's bashed all the hell, your armor's on fire. And you're not wearing any shoes or pants. That's what their designs do. And when the DM goes, well, I get DM burnout. It's just part of the process. No, it isn't. It's part of the design itself. The design does that to you. This design, I could sit here and create millions of these. Not burnout. I just spit this out. This is all just, just did this randomly. Thinking about the core of the design, which is very specific. Very specific. It's a troll bridge. We know this, and it says resources for a location are with measure. That's what this is. There are resources available elsewhere to solution this. There's a path from the problem where the resources are low to the solution where the resources are high. There's an unknown force resting between those two points somewhere. Preventing from reaching the solution. And how is that determined? There's a measure of success and fail along the path itself. And a measure of success and fail between the party and the unknown force. The unknown force stays there and continues what it is they're doing if the players have failure. If the player has success, the unknown force is gone because they eliminate it, or is moved at least for enough time for them to reach the solution. We don't know how long the solution remains, only that they do reach it long enough for it to be considered a solution. That is the foundational design of Billy Goat's Gruff in the story. That is the measure in which they followed, extracted it out using foundational design. The writer doesn't know it's in there. They merely wrote a story in general to specific with the measure of three within it, leaving their openings in the story that it could be told a bunch of different ways. There's a reason why. It was an homage for them to ancient storytelling in which the story is told, and as it passes on from person to person, the story can take on new features and new things. You could switch this to that and that to this. And, oh, wow, I got my audience. I'm really telling a cool story. And the audience would pitch in different things and be like, oh, does so-and-so find such and such? And the person would be like, yeah, so-and-so finds such and such. They have to go through this and they get to there. And the stories expand and contract. That's how it works. That same process is literally tabletop RPG in its most primitive, we'll consider it prehistoric, age of its space that is how it was originally 
there is a back and forth happening from a design that is general. And the specific components add to that. When Gary, mentality-wise, history as well, when Gary would sit there and do military reenactment, right? That is where they started, Dungeons and Dragons. He would sit there, Dave Arneson, probably sitting right there with him, playing military reenactment. And you're doing that, they had historical weight attached to those things. In the process of doing that, repetitively, a light bulb ignites. Imagination takes over, and the story starts to go outside of historical weight. It stretches, but uses that as a foundation. They start to build other things. New forces that don't exist, that have their own histories, in replication of the suggestive prehistory from other things. It expands further, right? They start going backwards from current age at the time, military reenactment, farther back into medieval, and maybe even back further, right? To tribe mentality, right? You're talking about prehistoric dinosaurs moving, whatever. The mentality of the brain starts rewinding historical weight, and you start developing new worlds. J.R. Tolkien, setting in the military, in his war zone, more or less, writing stories for Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, the entire world, with the historical weight and value and applying things happening in the space by reshaping and applying the concepts of foundational design inside. Story has foundational components, like I said. Gandalf's on the bridge, right? He's standing there. They're traveling through the entire underbelly of this mountain. Knowing full well, somewhere in there, there's a troll. The troll is the Balrog. They don't know what it is. It's un unknown until after. Once Gandalf sees it, once Gimli sees it, they go, well, that's not good. That's a hell of a troll for us to deal with. And they have to make a choice. Like I said in the other module when we were working on it, and I was saying different options for that same one section of the module. Changed it a bunch of different ways to show how the layering process works, using success and fail to change the story space and how probability would change it. Because the players aren't necessarily successful all the time. They don't necessarily fail all the time. And there isn't just those two measures. A D20 system has a range between 1 and 20. Minimum requirement for success, they set at 10 for certain things. But a lot of people don't know how that works when the characters level past that. They're not factoring in anything but the dice. And you watch them, you see them playing, and they just stop using the things the players are actually having. Right, The values the players assign to the dice are gone. And it's like, no. When you're doing a measure of success and fail, you're supposed to add relevant modifiers to the dice roll. So if you rolled a 3, but you have a 7, you have enough success. And they go, well, but I rolled a 3. And I said, but your modifier is a 7. So even though the dice is extremely low, you still have enough minimum-wise, based off of their calculation, to make it happen. And they go, well, but the dice was really low. And I said, yes, it was. I said, now, when I look at the design... They're not supporting the dice value below that. There isn't anything in there until I get to one. So in that range, there's nothing. I said they don't remember mechanically how that space actually works. There is a range, and there should be a measure between there on how things happen when the dice itself has a value. And then when you add the value to the players. Because the game itself happens with or without the players. They don't have to be in the space for it to happen. They're entering into the space. That's why they can't ever control the space. Because their characters in the space only change certain things about it. They're not omnipotent. They don't know everything. They don't know the feelings of every creature. They don't know the full range of success and fail. There are things that they're not apprised of. It'd be like 
if you went to a different world and you were like, well, I'm here, I'm human, so I'm in charge. Well, good luck with that. Because what if there's something else there that doesn't follow the rules of human mentality? These are monsters, right? We have tons of them. I have well over 100 different playable things here that the characters could select to play in the worlds of Grigor. And I'm not done because the other walls over here, we're pushing 200 at this point. Plus, I got the rest of the floor and fauna. I've been busy. I've been drawing and creating. I've got a crap ton of modules. It's ridiculous. Like I said, foundational modules. Building Grigor backwards from a module, we're building a world. So every module builds more components of the world. Well, I'm building it in pieces continuously. There's tons of stuff here. I'm one person. I'm not a team of people. This is one hell of a world space. Plus, we have the layers of contingency, which I've been doing this for 40 plus years. So there is a range of things across the time frame. I've got over 75 modules sitting right here, and I already I've wrote 40,000 already in my time frame. Plus, obviously, thousands of people, over 40,000 players as well, um, consistently. Not including the walk-ins or private clients or anything else. Just consistent weekly player base, because they used to run 13 groups multiple times during the week for a large range of time spans, depending on how aggressive they were for the week. So there's a lot of stuff happening, right? The space itself has a range. So when you look at it and you put the players in, and they walk in and they start using their measure in the space... If you don't break that measure out, remove action economy, take their core design and throw it in the garbage, turn it all the way back to its base, take all the monsters back to base. I don't care what challenge rating they have. The whole thing is a mess. All of it back to base. You won't have as many problems. I've done it already fixed it so that I can go in and do that every time. doesn't matter. I can run every edition at the same table, same time. It's in the same brand, not a problem. I can also run other brands inside. And why is that? They're like, well, how can you run Pathfinder and Green Ronin and all these other ones, the same table with Dungeons and Dragons? And I said, because they're all using the same foundation. They just don't know it. And no matter how much they want to deviate from it, their components that make it theirs is very slim. They didn't put enough of themselves in the design. They didn't. And the design that's there, they don't know. Gary wasn't instructional, so he didn't pass on to the teams of people, even through success and fail, of them doing what they were doing in their job. There's times when there was success and times when there was failure, right? And they measure it differently. Like the new age, they go, oh, well, we're the best. We're at the top because our sales are this. It's like, well, you're global, dummy. Why don't you look at local sales comparisons? Because local sales comparisons is not the same thing. You probably sold more back then than you're doing right now. You've opened up a new market. Obviously, the numbers are going to go up. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to do that. There is another market you just added yourself to <laughs> quite exponentially. It's not just this space, clearly. So you have to measure it in its relation, and they don't know how to do that. If you take the players and you put them into the space and you move them out, you, let's say you take the players and you're like, well, I'm going to move them from this space and I'm going to put them in this space. The player's perspective only gets information from what you feed them. They know nothing. They see nothing. They don't know whether they're falling through the sky or their characters are done. They have no idea. They have a sheet. They have nothing. They could sit there at the table and talk amongst themselves. But there is nothing in front of them. There is no space with which their characters can move around if it's not being presented to them. Either through the DM, GM, GO, right? Or the product directly, if they're going DM, GM less, right? It doesn't make any difference. Their measure is always through the measure of something else. They don't get to measure themselves. That measure of success and fail the value of information coming from it is all measured from something else. They don't have that power in the space. I know they want to, but that's a different space. It has to be created differently. This design allows them to have full autonomy in the space. They can look and go in every direction. It doesn't matter. 
and it doesn't put undue stress and hardship on the person who's trying to rein all of that garbage in because players can get squirrel mentality too, just like a designer can do. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. And information can be fed in a certain way to make them go. They're handed or can observe the compass, but they didn't build the compass. They don't have control over the way the compass works. They can merely observe it in their possession or through the possession of others in order to direct themselves through the space. Their measure of success and fail is measured by something else. They don't get to choose their measure. They can only choose their actions, and then it is being measured by something else. They forget that, and like I said, it's not instructional, so they don't know. They start to play in the space, and they don't understand how far the range is. And if measures aren't being established properly or consistently, which obviously the brands don't do that consistently, the person trying to do it, it falls to them. And if they're new, or even if they've been doing it a long time, in the process, it can change the mentality of the space. It creates a problem. It creates a barrier. And that's the same barrier that leads to DM burnout, DM versus GM mentality, right? DM versus and GM versus player mentality. You get the measure of entitlement that throws in there, the layers of toxic and trying to break the things that were established. You get the misinformation on how session zero operates. It's a continuation space, not a one-time only space, right? So the space is constantly being changed in favor thereof or not in favor thereof, and nobody knows what the baseline is if it's not done properly. It screws the logistics up, and it trashes the design where you can't even tell stories anymore. It's just a bunch of people sitting there not knowing what's going on, and they may or may not pay attention to the mechanical nature of the space, which is the only thing measuring what's happening. You don't have to use the dice to make that happen. The space itself has measure. Dice or not. I've ran groups that are used to running D20 system with and without dice, and they couldn't tell the difference. They had the dice in their hand, right? Remember, people learn differently. We have the verbal and textual information. We have the visual people who has to have it. And we have the people who require tangible components, right? Kinesthetic. So they have the dice, right? The game has physical components. And they, they think, if I got to do something, I got I to have that in my hands, right? I got to have my dice. I'm going to make an attack with my character. I need to know what my damage is for my character. So I got to roll that. I got to roll the randomosity of that in this instance. And I said, why would you roll it randomly in this instance? I said, you clearly have the advantage over this creature. The creature does not know you're there. We've already established it. We've already done measure to it. They don't know you're there. There's nothing stopping you from putting the blade where it needs to go. I don't care about armor. I don't care about anything else. You have the time. You have the advantage. You have the skill. Your character does the maximum amount of damage they could do. Your blade hits successfully. What is the number? Because that is what they should know. But when they're spending so much time going, well, my character is going to go over here and, and I want to do this thing, but step outside the boundaries of what they can control and start telling the space what other things in the space are doing. It's like, no, you already have enough to deal with. I did that in that space very purposefully. Because I wanted the players to know what their character can do. I wanted everybody in the space to know what everybody's character can do. Individually and collectively. So when so-and-so would do his thing in their turn, I said, you're going to do your thing. Everybody's going to pay attention and understand the process. Because everybody was trying to tell other people what they were doing with their character. And I said, no, that's their character. I said, you complain about you want all this over here, too, to be under your control. And now you also want to control this other person's character. I said, so you're the only one that gets autonomy and you can control every piece? I said, you're in the wrong seat. 
They're like, what do you mean? I said, you should be in this seat. And even here, I can't do that. I don't have that power here. I don't have that association to the space in that way. I said, I'm only allowed to do certain things. I said, but there are things I can do that you will never, ever be able to do in the space because that's not the seat for you. You're a character and you control your character. I have to control multiple characters simultaneously and know what characters that aren't even here are doing also in the story. And the only way that I can do that is with measure of consistency and measure itself. I need to know the logistics. I need to know that you know how to do what you're doing. Otherwise, the immersion is broken for you and for me. It becomes work then instead of a game that we're all playing together. It ruins the space. So we did that quite extensively until they finally realized what each other person could do. And I said, you would know that already after 20 sessions because we played quite a lot. I noticed it was starting to get worse and worse and worse. And I said, okay, okay, okay hold on. Let's pause for a minute. This is going to be a group that's going to be a problem. Chemistry is off. We've got a lot of people who are in charge here. And none of them were ever put in the position. We've got to get the job descriptions out and start running through the list. So once we did it, I said, you are... And they would say, oh, well, I'm so-and-so. I'm, I'm this character class. And I said, okay. I said, you sure? I said, I just want to make sure that that's who you are. I said, you're not the baker over here. You're not the blacksmith over here. You're not the monsters. So you can't control any of those pieces from your character seat unless you have some way through your character to do that. If you don't and you start pitching it out, I'm just going to wait for you to get done. I said, we'll do this and we'll keep doing this until everyone at the table here understands how far their space is. I said, you have enough to deal with here. You've got powers, you've got recharge rates, you've got movement spacing, you have the whole action uh, to deal with. The, the action economy for your space is enough to limit what you're doing on top of its repeat, because it's micromanaged, over and over again. I said, by the time you sit down and figure and calculate all that out, how do you even have time to do all this other stuff? I said, that's why your character as not being as impactful in your turn, that you have to try and take another character's turn and pull the spotlight away. You're constantly grabbing a spotlight from somebody else. The idea in the space is to widen the spotlight's ability. That's what we do in this. Foundational design allows you to get the widest range and still maintain that many components in motion because it's got its logistics handled. When you move through it, you have the whole space, but you don't have to use it all. You know you have it all. It's there, and you're only focusing on the opponents at that time that are important. And when you're focused on those components, those components will tell you, I am also connected to these components. So whatever happens with this connects to these. And you'll know how it measures because it tells you. This happens here. This happens over here. You don't have to do any extra work because it's covered already. Like I said, what are the things we need? We go through it. We've got to make sure. It's easier to do that. And when the players sit down and they do their thing, they do their player thing. They won't have time to be trying to take other turns or telling other people what they're doing with their stuff. This monster has to do this because I say so. Well, does your character have the ability to do that? No, they don't. And success and fail isn't going to be the measure of the entire time. There are things outside of success and fail that occur. Like I said, there are untouchables. That thing remains. That thing stays and does what it does for a reason because your character isn't measured to that. The players have the mentality if it's there, then I can interact with it and kill it. Well, everything doesn't have to die. And interaction isn't the only way to make something happen in the space. It may just be doing its own thing. There are things in the space that move without the ability for other things to impede their movement. They're doing what they're doing. And there's a reason in the design why they do that. 
because they're a thing that can't change. They're a core component in that instance because they have a direct carryover to something else. They are a thing creating motion for something else, not just themselves. If they stop, then all the things connected to them stop, and that could be the end of what it is. If it's not time for the end yet, then that would be a premature end to the situation. Now, there are times in which the players have the right measure to cause that to happen, but the design has to be prepared for that so that it can handle that. If it isn't, and they manage to come up with something, because sometimes they do, the design would show you in there how the situation ends, because the end is the end. It's in there, obviously. And it would show the carryover. So if for some reason something occurs within the design that it ends before it's supposed to, before it even gets to the table, if you look at it by taking a walk around the design, you can usually find it quite quickly because you'll see there's a hole there. Holes are how players get that ability. Holes are something that wasn't accounted for in the design. You've created a thing, and the players go, oh, well, it's this thing here, and I can get through it. It's like, well, look at your range of characters. You know what they're capable of doing in the design. They're only able to do things within the design, obviously. Their characters can only do things from the system itself. There's only things within the entire space. That's what they can do. All of those things in combination. By looking at it in that fashion, you won't create a hole like that unless you want to. I've done it. I have it. I mentioned it yesterday. I said, if the players are in the space and we're not using troll brew, I had two other designs in here that I had mentioned yesterday. And I said, this is Trollbridge. Billy Goat's Gruff, right? Sometimes I call it Gruff. It's the code name for it. But in measure, it's called 357, right? It's not the only module, foundational module, modular module that I have. I have a lot, quite extensive. In here, that particular component that we were just talking about is re reward before failure. The players have found a opening in the design, but it was put there purposefully. I have made modules for groups of players where you know that module is going to be tough, designed foundationally, and I put in there that there is a one way that the players will be able to go through that module at an exponential rate, super fast, and bypass all the dumb. They win the day doing these components and combinations of things. It could be any character, but I purposefully go through and select things that I know they could do if they'd figure it out that would defeat this thing before it should be able to be defeated. Very purposeful. And I have another component in the module setting there waiting for that moment. Once they do this thing, what happens after? If they do things prematurely, right? So they get a reward before their failure, right? They didn't get the chance to be tested by measures of success and fail. They just had the measure of success. They had a one-off that immediately wins the situation. Oh, they are without fail. They didn't have a single failure because the thing that was the opposition has been removed in one go. Billy Goat's Gruff as an example. If for some reason, Daddy Goat went across the bridge first, the other two goats wouldn't have an issue crossing. Daddy Goat would have yeeted the troll off. Story over. The other, tro the other two um, goats going across would just be able to go get grass. They'd come back and say, hey, wow, that bridge leads to a lot of stuff. And Daddy Goat would be like, yeah, I know, I was already over there. I already had some. Be like, oh, okay, cool. We just keep going back over there? Yep, no problem. Everything's good. And not say anything to anyone. Daddy Goat took care of it. 
But Daddy Goat was placed in the end, right? There was a sequence of events that transpired. Whether Daddy Goat goes first, second, third, doesn't matter. Daddy Goat's measure is still the same. His measure still retains. The other two goats, their measure is uncompromised. It remains the same. The troll just wasn't there. If the troll was there, the process would be what it was originally, depending on the sequence. Maybe the second troll went there, or the, the second goat went there first. And then baby goat came after. And he'd be like, well, that other goat lied to me. This goat's smaller, not bigger. And he'd be like, grabbing the goat, baby goat, well, down you go. You can't defend yourself, and there's no baby goat, right? Change the story a bit. Obviously, in that measure for this one, it's been put there and accounted for, because you have to do that. If you put the logistics in, let's say the king, right? I said, what happens if the heir is there? And the heir is not the heir that needs to be there. They're corrupt. Maybe they're allied with one of these other people, and they're going to take over the kingdom. He's the one that poisoned the king. Could be. Changes the story. What happens if the heir gets killed, and he was legit, nothing wrong with him, but the enemy wins out and kills him, let's say. Let's say the king also dies. They're both dead. Two failures. So we absolutely have to have success. Well, in that instance, the players find out the secret of fallen kings, right? Doesn't matter. Another king's going to sit on the throne regardless. That's what's going to happen. Kingdom isn't going to set empty. Someone's going to go there. If one of the other kingdoms goes, well, they're both gone. Cool. I'm the king over here now. We'll take it over. I'm the king here, or I'll put somebody in power over there. That's the thing. There's a throne. Somebody's sitting on it. The throne doesn't set empty. <laughs> Even if there's a steward, the steward will be sitting on the throne. So that's one of the secrets, right? It's like the little fallback. So even if the players don't measure success and it's failure in the design, a story still is being told over the process of where they're there. The world will still build itself, right? There's no king, but then there is. And they have to have adventures that trickle from that space after that. So this is a, a one-off that they go into. It happens to be a starter module, let's say, because this could be starter module. The heroes walk into the space and boom, they deal with this. They don't have very good success. You know, the dice is cursed or whatever. They don't use the dice and they just make bad decisions. It doesn't win out. Something happens. Fail, fail, fail the whole time. It doesn't mean the story stops or the characters instantly die, right? That's failure of design if it's not looked at properly. They only can do what their characters can do. And there is a measure of success and fail for a reason. Because there is a range of things that can respond to that through their character. Whatever their decision happens to be makes adjustments to the specifics of the story. The general concept, like I said, foundational, generality, with specific supporting the general, the general remains the entire time through the whole thing. The player's measure of success and fail is on the generality of it. Their success and fail is the specific. It's required for the story to take shape. Otherwise, it's happening in the background. And it can change the world. I've had players, I've made a module, right? To explain this even further. I ran the module. The players weren't doing what was in the module. The players were doing something else. But that didn't stop the module from happening. So the events in the module continued on. I rolled for them, measure of success and fail between the different things. Let the dice decide the situation, right? Things move. The players were doing things outside of the space. They weren't interacting with what the story had. They didn't have an interest in it. Until after the module was complete. When the module was done, because it was done, I rolled it up until it was finished. So in this instance, let's say the king and the heir both die. They don't care. They're in there. They're doing their thing. They're in the market square. They don't care until all of a sudden the entire place is being invaded by an opposing army that starts to take care of the entire city, right? They're coming in. Time to take over. We're here. I'm in charge now. That woke the players up. They hopped right in. They were doing their player thing. Save the city, right? Big battle. 
They kill the bad guy. The modules still have them. They didn't interact with the heir. They didn't interact with the king. They didn't go get the item. They didn't go find out what was happening down in the crypts. None of it. But when the invading army came in, then the players responded. They went in, battled, and took out the opposing army. They still saved the kingdom. So the module, even outside of the space, the player's choices, still affects the space itself. But they don't have control over how that works. That's up to the DM, GM, and GO to spin that tail. In foundational design, like I said, we're the only ones that do that. It accounts for that too. Like this. Reward before failure. In that module, I purposefully put a loophole to get them from the beginning to the end rapidly. So it would just be done. Because I wanted to test what happens with the players. In that instance, sometimes those type of modules are needed. Or even I have another one that's after that. Punishment for success. So the players are successful, the module's done, and they figure, oh, well, everything's good. And then all of a sudden, something horrible happens after. And they're like, well, we thought everything was done. We did everything the way it was. I said, this group of people that was operating in the background are not happy with that measure of success. So they're coming in to reset the balance back. They prefer chaos over order. Oh boy, they woke up. Sometimes modules like that happen. It's not DM versus player mentality or any way like that. It's because the characters have a story to tell also. And in the measure of them telling the story, the entire world space doesn't revolve around them. The module doesn't revolve around them. Like I said, the whole module is gone without them until the end. We create opportunities of heroics. We give the players information enough for them to make informed decisions. If the players choose to not make a decision in the instance, informed decision. They've been told about the space and they choose not to respond. That doesn't stop the space from moving. That was their opportunity to interact with the space. The space carries on. And makes decisions without them. It doesn't wait any longer. It's waited. That was their opportunity to make their measure. That is a thing they don't understand because the space hasn't been instructed in that way through a duration of time. When tabletop RPG started, it was a measure of success and fail primarily. First and foremost, no matter what was done, Something was consulted and measured before the thing was done. The immersion wasn't there until stories and the design started to fade back a bit from repetition. And success and fail mechanics faded back a bit. There was still tension on them consistently. But the designs reflected it a little different. They started to back away and take a wider view of the space. They have jokes that they do, and they're like, well, I cast Fireball. Even though you told them that the room is three foot by three foot, there's a monster that comes in, and the caster can cast it. Right? Action. Economy. Well, I can do it, so I'm doing it. And then everybody in the room is on fire, including the monster. Because measures of mechanical nature to spells didn't allow for them not to catch their friends on fire at that time. Because they didn't have control measures of magic. It was still raw. It was still uncut. It wasn't perfected in that instance. Then as casters progressed in the branding system, they started to gain the ability to warp and twist magic more precisely. Instead of just raw harnessing. Either through objects or as conduits themselves. They started to be able to shape it themselves. Then events transpired, specific brands, that caused magic to branch out into different types of magic. Other things started to surface. So the space itself has had things happen. In the modules, when you design them, when you design the logistics like we did here for this particular one, we got the king, right? I'm still using this one foundational component, this whole thing. Billy Goat's Gruff at base. In the design, when you look at the design, 
You can't see a bridge. You can't see a troll. But when you look through the design, as you're motioning through it, they're revealed at a different pace. They're not up front. We're dealing with kingdoms here and unknowns before knowns. In the other space, they know more already. Someone else is informing them with things before they discover them. In this space, we take a step back. We don't let them find out directly those things until later. That changes the way the visibility of the troll bridge is in the space. Because we have the ability to do that. Players can't do that. If the players say, well, we're going to be fighting a troll here. Well, you could be. Perhaps. Perhaps. Maybe they have an army of trolls that they send out. I don't know. Could be. We don't specify it here. Until we get down into the components and we say, well, we need to know. What is, right? What is their capability? What is their roster for their military components? We don't know. We need to know that because they're going to be using it, right? So as they move through that space, we're feeding them information. We got our spoon, we got our bowl of information, and we feed it to them one bite at a time. Wipe their face, burp them a bit, back down they go, and we continue to feed them. They know their space. They know what they can do. They know where all the information is coming from. We have it. They don't have it. They only know their own space. That's it. When they start stepping out of that, it changes the space to something else. Like I said, these can be built like I have it here, to run solo, where the DM or GM plays this with no players. The randomosity tells it. They create whatever they want in the space. They could pick any person. They could pick to move, because we're the DM, GM, or GO, right? We can move into any body or position within the space. We can walk all around our design. In it, everything. We can go into the item. We can go into the kingdom, the castle. We can look at the castle from an orbital view. We can zoom in and get into the position of the baker who's in there working on some bread. And they have a customer standing there. We know all the things happening in every direction. The players don't know any of that. They only know what we tell them. And what their character interacts with. The decisions they make informs them with other information. They're not writing it in the space. They're not the designer of anything but their own character. We have to take care of every single thing else. And we can't assume anything. We have to assume the widest range of players will be there. Could be thousands of people. We have to assume the person sitting there has never run a module before, even if we're writing it for ourselves. The only way to do that consistently is to take it all the way back to the base, back to the foundation, and build it like it's a foundation. It's in place. It's the general concept. It doesn't move. It stays there through the entire design. And every time we add another component to it, we're just reinforcing and referencing it and relying upon it to maintain the whole rest of the space. You don't build a house from the roof down. You build a house from the blocks at the bottom of the foundation all the way to the top. Otherwise, the whole house comes down. There's a reason why that happens. Because you can't build it that way. It's impossible. Even in a zero gravity space, <laughs> you can't build it from the roof down. You have nothing anchoring it to the ground. They don't know the components of that. And you can always expand foundationally. You can always expand. You can add more foundation and then build up from that. You can build three stories up. You can build five basements if you want. You can choose in any direction, left, right, upside, down, inside, out, whatever you want. 
But as the components put in place, it's assumed that more components go with it. You don't just build a foundation and then nothing else, clearly. This foundational design creates a modular module. We've had it here, expanding exponentially. This one here, most likely, like the other one, is pretty exponential. I'll crunch it quick because we have three components moving continuously. So we have the king. We have the enemies, which are three. We have the kings within the tomb, which will back it back. Basic will go three as well. Why not? It makes it easy. So we know the king is dying. There's a chance that he survives and he does not. So we got that covered. We have the chance that the kingdoms take over. There's three possible combinations of that as well. We have the discovery or not discovery of the space below. Got that. So far so good. We move down. We have Again, expansion. We have an ancient evil. And the evil itself opposes, we have, either directly or manifests in front of the players themselves. So it's either in control of it outside of the space or directly in the space. That's what we have. Two options, basically. Nothing else. We move down, we have the guardian inside the basement doing its thing, along with the kings down there. They move their way, we have the crypts, we have the measure of success and fail within the crypts itself. Navigating it properly to find the guardian, or not, the secret down there is the main key point. We need to know what it is, we need to move through the space. It's stacking up. Continuing down, the players potentially could rally an ally with the air itself. There's the range of that concept. I've got that covered already. They meet the air, and we have the combination of the air's range already factored in. We also have uh, the tombs with the secret of the king, right? The capacity. So we have the range of the caretakers down there. So we're dealing with four things down in that space. The kings and the air itself. This is exponential. We're up pretty high at this point. Continuing down. We have the future of the events. We don't know what that is. The king could live or not. Covered it already. The solution is reached. Don't know for how long. So we have a duration of. Short or long duration of that space. We don't know. If we assume one kingdom is defeated, the others may or may not go. So we have the combination of success and fail across all four components yet again a second time. Because after the king is gone... And the air is gone, because we have the combination of that. That changes that also. So then who resides on the throne, we don't know. The illness of the king, he lives or he doesn't. All covered within the original ones. Come down here further and we take a look. Peek, 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 right? We have to the island and not to the island. The island itself has its measure. So we have that covered. We have the variations of the roles between... The measure of success and fail between the market squares and the kingdoms, because those all have range. So we have both of those, because it's exponential. We're already up there quite extensively. This is a pretty extensive module. It's got a lot of things going. So we have the necessary components. Let's look. Island already covered. Information about the air already covered. Requirements of the crypt already covered. NPC specific. Every one of those have been accounted for. Looking good. Keeper of the Histories is another person, which could change the course of the events. We have them reaching them or not reaching them, which alters the combinations. So we have a range. It's up there. Nothing else. So just with the measure of probability between all of those components is just a little over 7 million different combinations. This is a big module. This is pushing it big time. If I drop the space down to only its core, it's just a little over 170 different combinations at base without player interaction. Without player interaction. Without the NPC characters interaction. Just the space moving the components around. Easily over 150. Very similar to the other design. 
The other design was 144 different combinations, but it was only a singular component in a singular bridge. This is three moving possible components, plus the range of the four components against the space itself. You have three core and four expanded exponentially because they have success four and they have success against, which exponentially multiplies it. So by the time all of the things are calculated in, it's just a little over 7 million different combinations. There's no way in hell that module's stale. It can't be. You'd sit there and run it at a multitude of tables, and this thing's going to run a bunch of different ways. In the end, when you're done, every table's going to have a different story. Even a thousand tables isn't going to have the same story. Foundational design. I have no encounters on here. I have no mechanics tying this to anything. It's rote foundational. All of that stuff could be put in. It can be dialed appropriately to fit whatever the space is. It can be done quite extensively. You can get in and really dial it down. You could put it fairly competitively. Ally the players and make them make a choice between what kingdom do they reside. Who are you allied with? Maybe they're working against the king, and they're fighting the entire module working against them. I've had modules that I wrote, heroic in nature, and the players that I was running in the space had evil intent. That day, they wanted to go through the space as evil characters in opposition of where it would be. No problem. Forwards, backwards, inside out, upside down, sideways, right? So from any perspective, the module can be run, which amplifies the combinations, right? Exactly. Like I said, you move the space in whatever direction, you start to shift it up because every time it creates another range of probabilities assigned to the range of probabilities within the space. It's quite exponential. A regular module, typically, you'll be lucky to get just to squeeze over 25 at most. And that's just because they typically run five players and your measure of success and fail is very limited. You're using action economy for the space as a mechanic, especially D20 system. So action economy and the way that the logistics operate in the space, they're going to break it quite often. Give it to you, take it away, give it to you, take it away. Erasing their mistakes and just going at the baseline because they don't do foundational work, just at the base, the maximum range is 25. You have the measure of five characters doing success and fail three times, right? And the enemy only has a measure of success and fail once. They're only successful or they're not. They're either alive, defeated, whatever. Their range is limited. Player range has a measure of success and fail that's three components, typically, because you have their life and death where they can't interact with the space. You have their measure of success and fail where they're successful, and you have the measure of success and fail where they fail. Three. The player can only interact in the space if they're alive. If the player is not, they have no measure of success and fail. One of the components. They have the measure of success. They have the measure of fail. So three times five is 15. Pretty simple. Pretty straightforward. Times five, right? You end up getting 25 because action economy ends up taking the character's options down even further and subtracting it back. They give it to you, and then they take it away. Because action economy reverses the abilities of the characters already being managed through other means. I noticed it at age 14. I said, what in the hell is this? That could have expanded further. And this is eliminating the capacity for this to expand. Why did they put this here? This isn't going to work. And the more that the additions came out, the more that the system started to go into it, you started to see it. Fourth edition is a complete tangible representation of actual economy, the power system. We talked about that. For you, the power system is a tangible action economy, right? You're looking at it. Action economy is a checklist. It's not an expansive nature. It's a giant pain in the ass especially when you're trying to create. A player is sitting there and they want to do something, and they're like, well, I would like to do this, but they can't. It's not that their character doesn't have the capacity to do it, but they're out of things that they can do on their turn. They've already done certain things, and that's it. It's like, but your character has the capacity to do this. If that wasn't there, your character has the capacity to accomplish this task still. It is within their measure to accomplish this, but because of action economy, you can't do it. And somebody else will have to close that gap, and they too are also limited. Like I said, 
If the spell says somatic components, you're not running around while you're doing the spell. So if a character is casting a spell, the spell themselves could stop the character's motion by itself. Doesn't matter if you can move 60 feet, 100 feet, 500 feet, doesn't matter. You're casting a spell, cries somatic components. Now you can't. I'm casting a verbal spell. Well, I'm not going to trash talk somebody in that process. So my interaction option on my turn, right, my action economy, I can just check that right off the list because I'm casting a somatic spell. I can't. Can't use that as an option for me. Otherwise, I can't cast my somatic spell unless my somatic spell involves a new language where every spell I cast is just all trash talking, right? Then okay. I had a character who was doing that. They wanted to do intimidate while they were casting their spell all the time. I said, okay. I said, well, there's a way we might be able to squeeze that in mechanically. I said, all of your spell components, you would have to rephrase every spell. So every spell you cast from now going forward is comprised of trash talking instead of the actual words. You create a way in your language that you use for your spells to change up the way that you communicate those spells up. I said, you'll have to figure out the words that you use, but you're not allowed to use anything else. Those are the new components for those spells. Every spell requires you to trash talk the person. It was fun for a bit. And then they were like, man, this is getting to be a lot of work. I said, hence the reason most spellcasters don't do that. They have a command line like fireball. <laughs> and then the spell goes right in that instance, if that's the case. And it has verbal components, right? Depending on what spell system you're using. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just a gesture. It just depends on what space you're using. Because I've seen the spell in all kinds of directions. I've seen it where you can't use somatic and you can't use verbal components. But the fireball spell requires an implement. I've seen them where you have to channel the magic through or you have to gather the magic from something. Torches here. I got to pull the fire from that and then re-harness it and gain control of it first. I got to do a, a competition between the spell grabbing a hold of this flame and the flame resisting it. It's an opposed skill check for me to harness this fire from this torch. And now I can cast it. The contingency system has a multitude of ways in which magic can be used. Tons. The space looks cool that way. Get a nice range. I've had whole groups of the same, the same character class, per se, even though we don't do that in this space, but the same character class, per se, the build out. And not a single person was a replication of someone else, yet they were all accessing the same thing. They were all casters in that instance. There's no fighters, no clerics. They were all spellcasters. I had a group that was all just fighters, barbarian guys. Saw a whole group of them running through the space. There were no clerics, no healers, no nothing. We did that back in the day when they're like, you need to have one of this one. You need to have one of this one. You need one of this one, one of this one, one of this one. And then you also have to use action economy. There's a reason why that was. Because then they knew what the range was. And no matter what you decided to do, that was the range, no matter what. The spellcaster is going to be into the back. They're going to be casting their spells because they can't move and cast. You got the cleric who's doing the healing, so they ain't moving around. So we've locked both players down into that instance, or they'll move and heal someone, potentially. You got your fighter who's going to go up front. So that's the person in focus with it. We already know what their statistical range is. We can measure the monsters according to that. Not measure it in balance with everyone else. Just the fighter. We got the rogue who's going to do their thing. So we can measure all traps and instances there. Because there's no way the spellcaster is going to try to get into the trap. There's no way the fighter is going to try to get into the trap. It's going to be the person doing the trap. We're going to set that all up. We know the range already. Everything's decided. They have a maximum number of selections from a checklist, and they run through the checklist. doesn't matter how creative they word it, it's still the damn checklist. It sucks. It did suck. It still sucks, right? It changes the space. That's why they write stories instead of creating modular design, because they don't know how to do that. They don't have a foundational platform to stand on, right? They don't write it that way. It's easier to write it foundational. We're going to take and we're going to write one extremely risky. We're going to change up the measure quite a bit. We're going to completely eliminate the visual aspect of troll 
and bridge from the design. So in doing that, we have to get very creative with the troll and use some of the other components that we did when we were talking about trolls in general. So the troll, the opposition in that instance, may or may not have autonomy on itself. The troll may be locked to the bridge against their own will, we'll say. Could be cursed, could be something, right? Bridges typically don't move. But some can, right? We know this. A bridge can be in motion. I've seen bridges open and close and swing all over the place. So they have the capacity to do so. I've seen bridges totally fine. I've seen bridges collapse. I've seen stacked bridges collapse over time. I've seen them in just enough ruin that you can get across it. But the bridge is a challenge just navigating it. And even then, it may or may not stay where it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an unstable broken bridge. We're going to take a troll that isn't motivated by itself. We're going to move the space around and make the players see those things in motion. Mentality-wise, they won't know what it is. It won't, it won't register to them as it being that like it did with Billy Goat's gruff follow-up adventure, we'll say. So, we have to create motion with the bridge. So, resources for a location are with measure. Now, a good way to do this is to either take the location and give the location a range that exceeds the space that they can access. It's one way you can do it. I could take and do, well, we mentioned this, like Curse of Strahd, right? You've got Strahd, you've got Ravenloft. Ravenloft is, is reached from the bridge, the mists, right? They access Ravenloft through the mists. But then the mists disappear. They're in Ravenloft. The bridge is gone. And all they have is the damn troll. There's no bridge. It's just the troll. Because no matter where they go in Ravenloft, Strahd knows and can interact with them no matter what. And the favor, because there is no bridge, is on Strahd. Really, the measure of success and fail against Strahd is more successful if Strahd could be removed from Ravenloft. And the only way that you're going to remove Strahd from Ravenloft is by going and finding one of the other individuals that operate in the same logistical space and ally with them in some way or measure and dethrone Strahd from his position. you got to use another troll to defeat the troll, right? So in this instance, we're going to take and we're going to set up a space. We have to get creative. We need the space to be a space that's already in motion. So, I'm going to use a creature and give them a space. Historically, there has been a range of creatures that they have built islands upon them, we'll say. I could make the creature stay in motion as it is alive, but in this instance, I'm going to kill it right off the bat. So I'm going to say that the body of an ancient dragon floats among the waves of the sea upon its corpse. Has sprung a wilderness unknown. The trove of the dragon consumed.
the treasures within the corpse began to break down in the biology of the dragon. Because dragons can sustain themselves on anything. It doesn't matter. Their body will digest it all. Dracundrium separated What up? Separate. I said it. Yeah, it caught it. The Jacundrum separated the magic from which provided it. And it still could not restore itself. Its injuries too great from a battle afar. It fell from the skies lifeless. The magics weeped from what it once was, and the treasures deep poured from it. Which happened. It's ties to things that create the worlds transformed the dragon's corpse into an island that moves. Its bones created mountains. Its fires fueled the inferno of its highest peak. The forests sprung up from its degenerating wings that lay broken Magic rages unchecked. But over time, it is expended as a world is born from death. Back, Jack. So, there are resources available, there was, elsewhere to solution this, right? So, even the death of a dragon 
does not end its bloodline. Deep within the dragon's heart still beats. Crystallize and in motion it fuels the eruptions of the tallest peak beckoning those who might find it. Right? The dragon's heart of hearts. Once the Jacundum breaks down, everything that the dragon is is consumed and stored there. That can pass on to someone else. It doesn't have to be a dragon. There's a path from the problem to the solution. Fisherman, or a, a fishing village, near the coast, notices a plume on the horizon in a massive island of scale and measure. The great beasts that swarm the island, right? Seeking it, drawn to it, the beckon, right? Summons anything near it. The great beasts that swarm the island are drawn ever near. The blood of the dragon and its sentience infuse in all manner of life sprung from its form. There are those who wish to explore the island and those that know its dread. The heroes come upon a fisherman who has a tale to tell. willing to take them to the island that moves. So we have to build the bridge, right? Doesn't look like one, though. There is an unknown force working against unimpeded travel along the path to the solution. Well, we know. In the distance, the battered wings of a dragon beat. Scars upon its form. And treasures hung beneath its feet. It is looking for something. Something that it wants. A prize it is entitled.
battle yet complete. So this dragon fighting another dragon. The other dragon and this dragon, this dragon takes off. Maybe assumed it took the other dragon out. This dragon takes off, assuming that it has won the battle. It leaves, not realizing, right, adrenaline and stuff. You don't know how bad you're hurt. Dragon takes off, takes flight, eats the treasure as much as it can, and off it goes, right? It's consumed what it can. It doesn't make it. Injuries are too great. The other dragon wakes up, it didn't die. Something kept it alive, right? You got two trolls fighting each other. So, he's in pursuit of the other dragon. He doesn't know where it is. And in this instance, the degenerative capability of a dragon changes. There are locations where dragons go to die. There are sometimes spaces in which a dragon will move to because it knows its end is near. A lot of times those locations are hidden, consumes everything, and hopes to take what it can with it. Dragon's body breaks down anything, right? It's everything is a food source. Doesn't make any difference. Eating certain things changes the dragon. Its biology will actually adapt rapidly. It has rapid morphification capacity. It's a dragon. In the worlds of contingency and the mechanics of contingency, dragon's capacity to sustain themselves is fairly deatific. They are extremely powerful and extremely dangerous. There are some dragons large enough to consume entire worlds. There are dragons that are born from the space itself, tied to the world directly. There are dragons that are born with no sentience. They're just monsters. There are dragons that are born with more knowledge and intelligence beyond the comprehension of mortal beings in general and have magic outside of their capacity even. So there is quite a range. We went over dragons before in a stream and I went through all the components of dragons. You may reference that in this process. But in the instance thereof, two dragons were battling, one dragon doesn't make it, thought they did, and everything that they consumed literally turns them into an island. The magic infused into a dragon, what radiates from it, the degenerative process of that magical leakage, right, creates an entire space. In the home world of the contingency system, this happened on a planetary scale. All of the dragons there were killed, except one. And they all are part of the landscape of that world. The world is called Anorith. It is the core world of the contingency system. I've got a lot of printed information about ran that location specifically quite a long time. Thousands and thousands and thousands of players. Probably one of the most played world spaces. But we have over 200 worlds, so obviously they all got some action in there. So, success and fail is measured along the path. So... The dragon who rests within its own heart is without motion beyond the waves. Though I have an, uh, an inkling that we may have some character from somewhere else pop into this. Because the dragon has some ties to other things that may know this. Their influence is good, especially if they're powerful. They can go into things like a ghost and manifest inside there, we'll say. So the dragon who rests within its own heart is without motion beyond the waves. And a lone traveler who 
who awaits. And I'll put the fisherman, right? Because he got close to the island. And the dragon got got in. Got into the old old man's mind. He's in there. Like a puppet, we'll say. The dragon that comes has other intentions. The island will not be lost for long, nor hidden. A dragon knows its treasure. Not a single coin unchecked. Right. So success and fail is measured with the unknown force. The coming dragon is old and powerful. But their injuries are great. Centuries of battle are upon it. And it is blinded by greed. It is after the stone, the heart of its opponent. The game has already begun. So the unknown force remains if failure is met. The dragon, if it claims the heart will reside and weigh its power on the island, the island's motion will cease and it will carve out A territory as ranged as its power. The lands surrounding space may not survive. This ain't somebody that you want to mess with. I already know who the dragon is because I have a thing there. So the unknown force departs or is departed by measure of success. So the heart has other intentions. It knows. It seeks to pass on what it once was. to prevent what its its history contained falling into the hands of the dragon coming
it may yet be restored, even as it is in the mercy of the waves. So the creatures beneath this place are obviously moving around. So success allows the solution to be reached. So the heart is found. The dragon heart is protected. And the lines of, or the line, the bloodline past. The conduit of it. sinks the island beneath the waves a grave of depths beneath so the entire island sinks the heart is taken, the island sinks, lava spills out, cools, what have you, it sinks. If the heart is claimed, the dragon is divided. But whole, right? Because it's still there, across all of them. If not, and is caretaken, the dragon restored, the fall of the Heartless, right? Dragon. Would begin again. Because they would start fighting again. Duration of success and, s and solution is not finalized. So, there is a place where a dragon cannot pass in life, but in death, it may walk again, or it may it may live again, we'll say, not just walk. Skies filled with fire. Its soul flying once again. Bound forever. So whoever does that, it's one heck of a thing. Okay, let's go back. Right? So the body of an ancient dragon floats among the waves upon the sea. I'll say its corpse Springs a wilderness unknown. 
the trove of the dragon consumed. The treasures within the corpse begin to break down in the biology of the dragon. The Tracundrum separated the magic from which provided it, and it could still not restore itself. Because if a dragon dies, that's the job of the Tracundrum. It will literally consume whatever it has to. It'll digest the dragon's body down just to keep it alive if it has to. It will break down bones. That's what sometimes happens to a dragon when they lose their wings. Something happened, an injury that was so great that it lost the capacity for it to sustain components of itself. Later, once the dragon's body is restored, those could possibly return. Sometimes they're lost forever. The Jacundrum has removed it. Like I said, it has the capacity to do things borderline on the bounds of creation. So, anyways, its injuries were so great, but still it couldn't restore itself. Its injury is too great from a battle afar, it fell from the sky's life force. The magics weave from what it once was, and the treasures deep poured from it. Its body evacuated what it had, trying to protect the soul. In the process of the dragon's Dracundrum absorbing everything the dragon is, whatever wasn't absorbed at that time just gets spewed out. And those things then leak and create. So as the dragon's being broken down, what it was magically wise its ties to different elemental properties and that starts to create life in the space how that works in the contingency system is an area burned by dragon fire is completely void of life but in a dragon's death life is restored could be wherever back at the location where the dragon fire burned it could start to sprout but as long as that dragon is alive the location where its fire was is gone. Though dragons also have the capacity to not destroy things if they choose to. They can shape their fire, so to speak. They could breathe fire around things and it does nothing. But harms everything else. It makes that choice. Consciously chooses. Even an unawakened dragon will do that. It has the ability once it recognizes it. So, the magic sweep from what it once was and the treasures deep poured from it. Its tied to, ties to things that create the worlds transform the dragon's corpse into an island that moves. Its bones created mountains. Its fires fueled the inferno of its highest peak. The forest sprung from it, fr sprung from its degenerating wings that lay broken. Magic rages unchecked, but over time it is expended as a world is born from death. A hell of a back package, right? That back jacket, that's pretty kick-ass. Even the death of the dragon does not end its bloodline. Deep within the heart, it still beats. Crystallized and in motion, it fuels the eruptions of the tallest peak, beckoning those who might find it. The dragon can call out. It can still communicate. It has no physical form, but it's not gone. The dragon's heart wasn't consumed by another dragon. We'll say that. Its magic wasn't expended to the point that it had nothing. One powerful enough has enough influence after its death to still do things, right? So a fishing village near the coast notices a plume on the horizon, a massive island. Massive island of scale and measure. The great beasts that swarm the island are drawn ever near, obviously feeding off of whatever is under the water that's not turned into it, right? No surprise there. And then eating dragon's meat in that case. It could contain stuff. It could just be nothing. It could just be just like regular meat. But those other things could be changed by the dragon's blood, right? It could do different things to the creatures around the island space. We'll have to make a note of that in the design. So the blood of the dragon and its sentience, infused in all manner of life, sprung from its form. There are those who wish to explore the island and those that know its dread. 
So some have went to the island and were like, we need to get the frick out of here, right? And others who were like, yeah, no, I don't think so. So the heroes come upon a fisherman who has a tale to tell, willing to take them to the island that moves. Obviously, We have someone. We have to create the bridge, right? So in the distance, the battered wings of a dragon beat scars upon its form and treasures hung beneath its feet. It is looking for something, something that it wants, a prize it is entitled, the battle yet complete. It's kind of like a little rhyme. Didn't really anticipate that, but we got beat and feet, and we got, uh, you know, complete also in there. So it's kind of rhyming. In the distance, the battered wings of a dragon beat, scars upon its form, and treasures hung beneath its feet. Sounds good. It is looking for something, something that it wants, a prize it is entitled, the battle yet complete. All right. Pat on my back for that one, I guess. Sounds good. I'm just spitting this out. Just going off the foundational design, that's all. So the dragon who rests within its own heart is without motion beyond the waves and a lone traveler who awaits, right? It's the fisherman. So it's managed to... Whoever got to the island first, it manifested enough into there that it's made an influence, right? Dragon's ability at range, even in death, to influence other things within range of it. The first time they are encountered, apparently the fisherman's mind was aged enough that the dragon could get into it, even in its weakened state. But only one guy, obviously. So the dragon that comes has other intentions. The island will not be lost for long nor hidden. A dragon knows its treasure, not a single coin unchecked. So this dragon thought it beat the other dragon and most likely took its treasure. I wouldn't doubt it, consumed it. And this dragon's going to be able to detect where that treasure is. Now, some of the treasure obviously was ejected from the dragon. Some of it made the island. It started forming the magic items, destroyed, and the magic started creating the space. Spawn trees and dirt and sand and whatever, depending on the magic components of the different items, elemental things, things that create things, uh, just started spawning all over the place, created a massive place. What didn't trickled down beneath the waves underneath, drawing the attention, right? All that sparkling and shining, if it was coins or whatever, is definitely at range going to draw the attention of other things. And once they arrive there with all that, thinking it's fish or something to eat, right? You know, if you ever went fishing before, you can drill a hole in a freaking nickel and stick a hook in the end of it and toss it out there, and fish will bite on that all day. And it's obviously not going anywhere. They don't have that kind of teeth. So you can get yourself some stuff. You don't have to use anything else. But the coming dragon is old and powerful, but their injuries are great. Centuries of battle are upon it, and it is blinded by greed. It is after the stone, the heart of its opponent. The game has already begun, right? Dragons have this thing, and they, they even breed other dragons, almost like gladiators to battle just like humans do it is not a thing that is not outside of their range of capacity because they themselves know and can do things repetitively understanding the finality of death so they battle for power. They make other dragons battle for power, right? Just like kings fight for kingdoms. Dragons do the same thing. Just like they put people in gladiator arenas, dragons do the same thing, though their process may be at range. Maybe over a course of several worlds that they do this, and they move other pieces around to make it happen. It's extensive. It's quite, quite a range. I've wrote about it often. So the dragon, if it claims the heart, will reside and weigh its power on the island. This is the bad guy, right, obviously, in the situation. The island's motion will cease, and it will carve out a territory as ranged as its power. The land surrounding the space may not survive. I'm going to put on here, though, the fallen dragon has created things of its own. 
in its likeness. To resist outside forces and to protect its heart. So it's not going to be like the dragon can just walk in. I'll say exhausting. what was left of itself. So there is no body of this dragon, really. Bones, but the form is gone. So the heart has other intentions. It knows. It seeks to pass on what it once was to prevent what its history contained falling into the hands of the dragon coming. So we're going to have to be dealing with that a little bit. Um, it does not want to pass on into the beyond, into the darkness between worlds. It may yet be restored, even as it is in the mercy of the waves. Of this world. The heart is found, the dragon has, is protected in the bloodline past. The conduit of it sinks the island beneath the waves, a grave of depths beneath. If the heart is claimed, the dragon is divided but whole, right amongst whoever does it. If not, and it is caretaken, the dragon restored, the fall of the heartless dragon would begin again. There is a place where a dragon cannot pass in life, but in death it may live again. If upon the altar of the world, its heart is placed. The sky is filled with fire, its soul flying once again, bound forever, we'll say, to the world, and those whom aided it. Bound forever beyond death. Because once a mortal person is bound to a dragon, it almost extends their capacity for life. I had a character, Lord Edmund Dragon's Bane, who aided a dying dragon basically did its last wish, more or less. Buried it within the mountain, took its heart of heart to a location the dragon decided, whatever it was. He, dragon's Bane knew nothing. In the process of doing that, dragons were coming after Dragon's Bane, of course. He was carrying a dragon heart, and they wanted the power it contained within it. They are drawn to it, even if it wasn't one that they killed. They know what it is. Assuming that Dragon's Bane killed it, they will kill Dragon's Bane before they try to take it. They're not dumb. They know the process of how that passes. In Harry Potter, the Wizarding World, right? Wizards can gain the wand of the defeated, much in the same capacity. They cast a spell... The wand is bound to the person who wins. If somebody else comes in and grabs the wand, it may or may not work for them properly. It might even repel the capacity for them to cast magic through it. It will defy them that much. It may even harm them if they try to use it. 
So, in the instance thereof, this dragon did kill this other dragon. So he's entitled to it. If the players try to use the power of the dragon heart, that could be bad. You've created a problem for them in that instance of success and fail. If they caretake it, instead, success, and they assist that particular troll in that instance, because there's more than one troll here, in defeating the other troll, by bringing the dragon back, or, in the instance thereof, acting with the division of the dragon's power to fight the other dragon and kill it. If they kill the other dragon, while infused with the power of the dragon, it breaks the chain of commands in that instance. That dragon who's dead is actually the winner in that case and would be restored back to life by absorbing what was of the other dragon. Changes them a bit. They look different. They become something a bit different. So, we create the trolls. Instead of placing the players on opposite sides of the bridge, we put a troll opposing a troll in the instance of. There's measure of success and fail between the two trolls to decide which troll is the one that they must battle against, right? Because in this instance, they can go and adventure to try to get to the one troll, resource-wise, right? Depleted the resources. The troll has resources, and the resources are depleted creates an island in that instance. The other dragon's resources are also depleted because the other troll took them. The only way for either to gain their resources back, dragon to life, dragon to treasure, and the, the heart, is to once again step back into the space which we consider the bridge. So, can't see the bridge in the instance of it being a bridge, you can't see the troll. Completely eliminate it from visual recognition. There's more than one bridge in this instance here. And it's being navigated around a bit differently. So it doesn't look like what it is in its foundational aspect, right? So the little old dude there, the little fisherman, he was first, and he gets chosen. He's going to be a bit different. I would say that he has some things about him similar to the dragon. Perhaps when someone comes up and tries to do something, and he might just turn and look, and he might not have the eyes of a human in that case. He might have the eyes of a dragon, and that person stuffs off. Because the dragons, it, that person is under the protection of the dragon. Life or death doesn't matter. So that person is protected. Someone trying to come in, and the dragon exhausts its resources to do this, of course. It diminishes every time, till eventually it doesn't have the capacity to do it. It will protect that person under its protection. So, we have a few things, right? We always address the dice as tools, of which we will. So we will use them because that's what they're for. So the dice as tools is category one. I'm going to make sure... We'll stick to the script. We'll do the components. And we will do the NPCs. So definitely we know what we need here. This will take a second. The dice has tools. We need to know the range of motion of the island. 
right? How far does it travel, right? How far away is it? We need to know how much, how much has the island been interacted with? What did they find, right? Whom did this? It's important. We need to know, we'll say the capacity of each dragon. There's just two. In reality, they're trolls, right? So we measure them out precisely. We also need to know the village itself. Populous boats range, right? Events happening within it, because there could be things happening there. Could be things because the closer the other dragon gets, because of its current state of emotion, we'll say, it does influence the space. We also have all those creatures out there, obviously, towards that island that are being changed dramatically from how that's being moved. So that's going to be a little bit of a range. So we have the events and we have the changes in the space from the presence. And oncoming presence. of dragons, because we've got both. We need to know that. And I would say variations of creatures born of the dragon. The treasure, well, we'll put that separate. We need to know the variations of creatures born from the items, right? Because the magic items. I'll say items, and then I will say from the magic. say the range of lasting magical effects on the island because that's important and we also need to know capacity of the dragon heart the capacity of the broken, I'll say heartless. We'll stick with that because that's pretty good. The heartless drag. Okay. So components. We need map of island. We need regional map. We need the village. I'll say fisherman village. We also need... Oh, let's see. Items could be magic, residue, magic up for grabs. We also need, um, let's see, the heart's imprinting. What can it give to someone else? Fairly limited with components on this one. Um, I guess the, the lure of monsters is also a piece that we might want to know. What's there? 
NPCs, really we have the fishermen. We have the dragons. There's two of them, obviously. Um, we might as well populace of the village. And could be the, sh uh, yeah, the village and then the populace of the shipwrights. Because the different captains could just not even be from there. They could just be using it as a port city. Because they're different ships. There'd be different ship names, obviously. There'll be different ship captains. We got both. Uh, and I'll put that there as a reminder. So we have captains. We have the ships. Easy. Oh, well, we could put the crew too, I suppose. I really want to. Might as well. We'll expand the crew too. It's fun to make little pirate ships and stuff. Okay, so um, what else? Fishermen, dragons, populace of the village. Um, the altar of the world. We need the information about that. It's pretty specific. Pretty much, I think that's about it. There isn't anything else. There wouldn't be anything specific. I don't think. I'll put... Roaming Trolls. Just in case. Explore... The distance... Of influence. And call... To other... Dragons. Yeah, I think that's it. Let's check it again. Carefully. So the body of an ancient dragon floats among the waves upon the sea. Its corpse springs a wilderness unknown, the trove of the dragon consumed. The treasures within the corpse began to break down in the biology of the dragon. The dracondrium separated the magic from which provided it and it still could not restore itself. Its injury is too great from a battle afar. It fell from the skies lifeless. The magics weeped from what it once was, and the treasures deep poured from it. It's tied to things that create the worlds, transformed the dragon's corpse into an island that moves. Its bones created mountains, its fires fueled the inferno of its highest peak. The forests sprung up from its degenerating wings that lay broken. Magic rages unchecked, but over time it is expended as the, a world is born from death. Nice. Even the death of dragon, of a dragon does not end its bloodline. Deep within the dragon heart still beats, crystallized and in motion. It fuels the eruption of the tallest peak, beckoning those who might find it. It is never mistaken as a simple gem. In legend, the dragon gazes back from within it. So, fishing village near the coast notices a plume on the horizon, a massive island of scale and measure. The great beasts that swarm the island are drawn every near. Better explore that a bit more. Ever near from the depths and coastline which they roam. This is a dangerous place. The blood of the dragon and its sentience infused in all manner of life sprung from its form. There are those who wish to explore the island and those that know its dread. Because the dragon, right, 
Yeah, it's still got some influence. The heroes come upon a fisherman who has a tale to tell. Bound. I'll say it's heart. Beats. And twin, we'll say. Willing to take them to the island that moves. So he's bound to the dragon, and the dragon's bound to him. At least he's got some way to move around. In the distance, the battered wings of a dragon beat. Scars upon its form, treasures hung beneath its feet. It is looking for something, something that it wants. A prize it is entitled, a battle yet complete. Right? So we know that. The dragon who rests within its own heart. Well, let's go back. Let's say um, is it seen? Because that could be a thing. Maybe no one knows that that dragon is coming at all. It could be. A hidden troll, which is fun. Why not? Let's kick it up another notch. The dragon who rests within its own heart is without motion beyond the waves and a lone traveler who awaits. We'll pause there for a second. Go back. Battle yet complete. So, hypothetically, players are on the island. They're digging around, doing stuff. They make their way out. They have this thing, and all of a sudden, this busted dragon with scars all over it crashes down in a very non-easy way. Looks like it just fell from the sky. It didn't land. It looks like it just fell. Its gaze tilts up, and under eyes with scars and blood dripping from its form, it looks directly at the players and say, you have something that I want. That's it. That's all it says. Then I go, usually what the players say, and they're like, well, we know what to do. Poop check. And I say, yeah, time to check. Might as well roll. Dragon said, you have something that he wants, and he's looking right at you. I said, roll for poop, because if you <laughs> mistake it, I hope it's catched somewhere, because it's going to be rough. So, Beyond the waves, and a lone traveler who awaits, which we know is the fisherman. It's tied to the dragon in some way. The dragon that comes has other intentions. The island will not be lost for long nor hidden. Because obviously, once he gains control of that, he has control of the island. It will anchor itself where it sets, or he'll move it. Because it's part of his treasure, right? So a dragon knows its treasure, not a single coin unchecked. Pretty straightforward. So the coming dragon is old and powerful, but their injuries are great. So it is old, it is powerful, but it's busted up pretty bad. So it's a little less than it would be if it was all powerful. Centuries of battle are upon it, obviously, and it is blinded by greed. It is after the stone, the heart of its opponent. The game has already begun, right? So the dragon, if it claims the heart, will reside and weigh its power on the island. The island's motion will cease, and it will carve out a territory as ranged as its power. The land surrounding the space may not survive, though the fallen dragon has created things of its own in its likeness to resist outside forces and to protect its heart, exhausting what was, was left of itself. The heart has other intentions. It knows. It, pat, like, it seeks to pass on what it once was, to prevent what its history contained falling into the hands of the dragon coming does not want to pass on into the beyond, into the darkness between worlds, which is what would happen. It may yet be restored, even as it is in the mercy of the waves of this world. The heart is found. The dragon heart is protected in the bloodline past. The conduit of it sinks the island beneath the waves, a grave of depths beneath. If the heart is claimed... The dragon is, is divided, but whole, right? 
It's divided amongst whoever claims it. But it is whole as far as that goes. So no matter how many times it's divided, it still has connection to everything. If not, and it is caretaken instead, the dragon is restored, the fall of the heartless dragon would begin again. Because it would come back to life and then start fighting that dragon. But it would be whole, and the heartless dragon is pretty busted up. So that would be bad for him in that instance. So the troll beats the troll, right? There is a place where a dragon cannot pass in life, but in death, it may live again. On the altar of the world, its heart is placed. Right? By another. Instead of claiming it, right? The sky is filled with fire, its soul flying once again. Bound forever to the world, that re rebirths it. So the dragon can never leave, but it's alive. And those whom aided it, it is bound to them forever. Bound forever beyond death. So even if they die, the dragon's still bound to them. What a treasure it is, right? So dice has tools, and we take a look at the range, right? So we've got range of motion of the island. We want to know how far the thing can travel. How fast is it moving? What is its distance to other things? How much has the island been interacted with? Like who went there? Who was it, right? we got the capacity of each dragon. There's two of them. What can and can't they do in their space? Originally, after, right, during the process, what do we got left? The village itself, the populace, the boats, the range, any events that are transpiring and changes in the space from the presence of oncoming um, and currently present um, dragons, obviously. Because we got one here and one coming. And that changes things. Dragons influence the world space greatly. Like a deity coming into a space. Dragons are incredibly powerful. Especially if they're awakened. Obviously these dragons have some measure of sentience. They understand things beyond just what they are. They're not on chains. So they are definitely aware of what they are. They have self-worth. We'll say that. So five variations, uh, we've got the variations of creatures born of the dragon. We've got the variation of creatures born from the items. And we have the variation of creatures born from the magic. So as things break down, the dragon, the items, and the magic itself, that soup of things, the primordialness of it, dragons are very impactful. New things are created depending on the things the dragon has. Let's say the dragon ate something. It was in its stomach. The dragon dies. Whatever it was in there, the dragon consumed its treasure and had enough magic, residual, in the space. Whatever that thing was could be born again from the dragon, now in a new location, with new abilities that adapt it to that space. Because remember, a dragon's Darwinism is exponential. So it will survive anywhere. A creature not normally in an area. This is contingency mechanical, right? So we're getting deep into some of the operations of how I developed the world spaces of contingency. If the dragon spews out a creature it has in part or in whole, that creature will become adapted to the space that it is in, even if it isn't a space it normally is. It will adapt, it will modify its body's biology, will adapt it rapidly. Once it has reached its adaptation perfection to get it into a niche in the ecosystem so it can survive, right? Maximize its ability to be able to survive, properly place it, then any other privileges it has at that point is gone, but it does retain residual dragon blood in the instance thereof. So there are certain things, randomosity-wise, that may carry over from the dragon to that creature. They may not have any at all. It may be relying upon that thing dying that something happens. But the creature is marked in some way in that instance. Things happen. Just FYI. So we have the range of lasting magical effects on the island, because obviously there's magic pouring all out of this thing. So we have that range. We have the capacity of the dragon's heart itself, and we have the capacity of the heartless dragon. Components, pretty straightforward. 
We have the map of the island. We have a regional map, the location where it is currently. We have the fisherman village, the items, the magic, the hearts imprinting capability, lure of monsters. And I'm also going to add, because I can, we might as well put where the battle began. We might as well. Um, and also, as I'm through this, because uh, I didn't put map of the altar worlds also, because we need that. That's why we do logistical foundational builds, because it will remind you what it is that you require. And I need that for sure. So then we go into the NPCs. We have the fishermen, the dragons, populace of the village, populace of the shipwrights, captain's crews, right? Ships. The altar of the world. We need to know that. And roaming trolls. The distance so and influence and call to other dragons. Because this is a dragon heart we're talking about here that could be exponential. This is a beast of a module. This one here is pretty extreme. You can't see the design right off the bat in it. It has been hidden right off. You'd have to know the design. But resources for a location are with measure, which we know. The dragon takes the treasure of the other dragon and takes off. Battle one, it figures. But it didn't kill the other dragon. Thought it did. Steals the treasure. There are resources available elsewhere to solution this. We have the opposition, because we have to come from the perspective of the other dragon. He awakes and goes back after his treasure. So there's a path from the problem to the solution. So either is trying to leave. We have the one dragon trying to get away from the other dragon. He died in the process of escaping. His injuries were too great and died, got turned into an island. The items and stuff decomposing in his, his draconic heart of hearts caused the degeneration of the magic and items, right? So that dragon's trying to get the hell out of there. The other dragon is trying to get to where the other dragon is. So we've got two bridges, more or less. In reality, it's one bridge moving at range. It's having additional things added to it. That's why the range of the dragon and also... The pace of the island floating away, which is the corpse of the other dragon, containing within it the heart of that dragon. One dragon's coming to get to this other dragon, not knowing this dragon is dead or alive. It doesn't know. It has no clue. It just knows the other dragon is this way. It knows its treasure is that way. Once it arrives to the location, it's just going to know the dragon's there. It's going to sense it. It's not going to know the dragon is the island. It has no clue. So there is an unknown force working against unimpeded travel along the path to the solution so we know that the other dragon is coming this way but the space doesn't know that they only see the island so we take a step back out and we create a bridge between the two trolls and the space the two trolls have a bridge between them but we've also utilized the bridge between the two trolls and the space We've created more or less a triumvirate situation. We've got two trolls and we've got the space. The space contains the players and also all the civilians in the surrounding area. It also contains the potential for another troll because another dragon could catch a whiff of this dragon heart or the other dragon who's weakened and injured. Once it gets within range, it'll be able to tell the other dragon is there, right? And it'll see this other dragon if that one arrives and he's all busted. So another dragon might show up. There is the potential for that. So let me come down momentarily as we ponder, right? In that module, potentially, we might need a little bit more there. I'll put dragon, finding dragon. The third troll or more really right because that is the instance thereof so back up to the original components here we're going foundational like i said so success and fail is measured along the path 
This is the foundational piece for troll bridge, right? So success and fail is measured along the path. We've done that. We've measured the space by moving the dragon in. So the players can go in and their success and fail measure. They can get to the heart on the island. There are those that want to go to the island and those that avoid the island. There's measure on the island space and getting to the island because there's all those creatures floating around it in the water, all those monsters in the water. Then there's the monsters on the island itself that they'd have to battle through to get to the space, obviously. And the troll that's on coming. So we've measured success and fail in quite a range on all three bridges because we have the measure between the two dragons also accounted for. Two dragons. One's dead, died after the battle on its way to leave. The other dragon wakes up and just knows where its treasure is, knows where the other dragon is at range because they've tasted each other's blood in that instance. So they both can sense the presence of the other. That's going to be a given, well, like Highlander almost. So success and fail is measured with the unknown force. We've got that taken care of, both of them in reality, because they may not know that there's a dragon on the island. His heart is alive. His body is dead. His body is the island, right? So the unknown force remains if failure is met. We know this. That dragon who comes here will consume the heart, take control of the island, anchor it, and make that his fortress and, and realm and pursue the entire area. Well, he'll cut out himself a range in the space. He will stay there. That could be a problem. The unknown force departs or is departed by measure of success. So either the players manage to get the dragon heart back to where it needs to go so the dragon can be restored to life, or they bind themselves to the dragon heart. Depends on the process, right? They might not have time to take it to the altar. If they bind themselves permanently or temporarily to the dragon heart, they may be able to face the other dragon in ways that you normally wouldn't be able to. They can fight it head on because they have the influence of what's left of that dragon within them. Depending on how many players that is, that could create one hell of a battle because other dragons nearby might notice that. It'd be like, man, there's a hell of a battle. There's like six or seven dragons over there fighting on some island. We better go check it out. What's over there? Could be something, right? The dragons catch a whiff of that. It could be a lot, right? Because it's manifesting itself within other beings. It's already doing that in the module to the first fisherman that got into its presence. The fisherman came to the island, came onto the island, and the dragon was like, oh, there's someone here. The person comes in, he's scoping all around. The creatures in the space are all just being what they are, not even being dangerous at all. The person comes in, gets inside, sees the dragon heart, and then inside the dragon heart, the dragon looks back at this dude, and boom. He's got him. Talks right through him and can move and act into him as if that person is a complete conduit of himself. So now he has motion. He walks outside, does what he does and activates everything in the space because now he can sense beyond his capacity and he can tell the other dragon's coming. So he starts moving the island as much as he can by having the creatures who are feeding on him tug and pull on his carcass more or less they're eating and yanking on him and every time they do that they're slowly moving the island keeps moving them and they get in there and they eat him so he's sacrificing what's left of his physical form to literally move the island not just with the waves but with the creatures beneath it and as they swarm and spin they're creating motion and dragging the island without them knowing that. He might have some creature that comes up and it's like, oh, come get this yummy piece up in here. And it gets hung up and starts kicking its little fins and it starts pushing the island even more and then it gets unstuck, you know, because his, his influence is not exponential. It is limited. It is dead, right? So, and obviously doing that process is still causing it pain. It is in awareness of what it is. So it knows that that's happening. So the unenforced departs or is departed by measure of success. So if they manage to do that, they may bring the dragon back and it's dragon on dragon battle or influence through it. So success allows the solution to be reached. They get rid of the other dragon. They then transition the power back to the dragon who had thought he won. Instead of him dying 
unknowingly and the other dragon living that he thought he killed. That dragon lived and he died. The complete opposite. So he's like, crap, that sucks. Doesn't have enough power, obviously. He did put it all in. The other dragon didn't because he got defeated. So that was like an offset. If he can manage to then turn back around and then kill that dragon, then he reclaims his honor and he's able to do what he does. He's back to life, right? So, again, right, they may be able to do it or they might not. Then you have the duration of success and the solution, right, if it's not finalized. We covered all that. All of that built different things. We used Billy Goat's Gruff, right? Troll Bridge. One measure on one side, one measure on the other. Moved them across. So we have one hell of a module selection here. So let me think about a name for that one momentarily. So let's go back up. We have Fall of Floodwater, which is a, a module designed in flow from Billy Goat's Gruff, as if the story continued after, if the troll lived when the goat hit him off the bridge. Troll bridge, right? Basic components. We use the same components, the same foundational components, because we stripped it down using contingency. We stripped it down to its foundational design. Took its base, made it foundational. From the foundation, we built a module. We use the same foundation, we build another module after this one. Completely another module. This one is more sticking to troll and bridge. There's obviously bridges and there's obviously trolls. In the second module, we hide the troll and we hide the bridge in the design. Not completely. And we end up with the module, The Secret of the Fallen Kings. We've got a king and an heir. And we have the opposing forces trying to take the throne. So we have three things in motion. We tie all the logistics together so nothing is forgotten. We take a look at all the components so that all the work and prep is done for whoever it is that runs the module. We do not create encounters. We allow the space to be able to be created from because it creates exponentially that way. So the first module can create 144 different combinations just with its design. This one's a little bit more. It's a little more complicated. We've got pushing it up towards almost 170. We move our way down. We continue building, right? We finish it. We get the next module. We're dealing with these dragons, right? We completely hide the bridge. We take the bridge and we make the bridge mobile. The dragon's body is the bridge. The troll becomes the bridge, literally, by taking the bridge and the troll and making them one. We have another troll that's coming in to take over the bridge, which contains the other troll. They were troll versus troll across their bridge originally. So we're coming from all the directions and combinations of which the bridge can be combined of which the trolls can approach and be bound to the bridge. Like I said, complex, right? But it's hidden because they don't have a clue. Same foundational design. We build an entire module. We just spit this thing out on here. It's no pre-work done. It's all right here. So we need to name this one. Got to think of something cool here. Um, I'm going to say... I'm going to make a note here. I'll say heart as a component. I'm also going to say the altar, possibly. And bound as the keywords. So I'll think about it for a bit. I might come back to it. Name it when we pull it out and put it into the other design. Because I want to give it something good. I don't want it to be, you know, poop. They have a real problem with naming some of their modules. It doesn't really pull you into the space. We have the island, but it's from the dragon. I could say the island of the dragon, right? But come on. That's a stretch. Really, it's just the heart. The dragon is the island. I don't know. The heart is a key component and so is the altar. 
I'll mention the island inside there just because I can. That lets me think. I like to use keywords from within that have a major effect. If I could only use keywords to describe the module, those would be the keywords that I would use. And I use that to help me generate a title for whatever it is. Anyways, so we hide the bridge. We create bridges. Three billy goats, gruffs, three goats. So I have the capacity to build out two, three of which I used. We have the two dragons and we have the opposition component, which is the players, another component in motion. On the player's side of things, we also have the other dragons that potentially could be in the space. Could be. Don't know. All of that can be randomized within there. And we have the dice to use as tools to make that app, of which we use. We have the range of the island. We have all the capacity of the dragons. We have the capacity of the dragon heart, which obviously, what does that do? Summons other dragons, potentially. We have the presence of oncoming dragons, right? That could be the thing. Capacity of the heartless dragon, the one that's all busted. The names and such. We have the components. A few maps, not too many for this one. It's not as many as the last one. Uh, that needed a lot of maps to paint the picture a little bit more. This one here, not as many. This one's fairly isolated. So even though it's very complex, and there's a lot of bridges, so to speak, in the design, and there is a multitude of troll potential, because we also have all the different creatures that are spawned from the dragon's body and the degeneration of items. So let's say there's an item that can summon some creature. When the dragon digests it, there's nothing stopping the creature from being spawned. Depending on how many charges were left on that item, those creatures could spawn in that space. The Dracundrum doesn't care about the spell, so it releases it as it consumes the physical aspect of it. Sometimes the Dracundrum of a dragon will digest the spell. It might need the mag magic of it to restore itself. No matter what happened, the dragon tried everything and couldn't consume any of the things from that treasure. Right? So it basically just digested the raw components as much as it could, and it still didn't work. Why? The other dragon was alive. It can't claim another dragon's treasure trove and consume it for power because it's bound to the other dragon until he kills it. It doesn't work. So, like I said, if for some reason the players can cause the death of the other dragon when it gets here, infused with the magic and power of the bloodline of this other dragon who's dead, and they kill it. The dragon who's dead could reabsorb all of that stuff and be back into itself in no time. The Jacundrum would is still active. It would restart. It would suck up the power of the other dragon's heart because he's dead. It would rapidly degenerate that dragon. It would manifest enough power to jumpstart the activity in the reverse. The island would sink to the bottom, disappear, and from the waves, which is the idea. When the island sinks, and they are victorious, and the island sinks, and they're on the boat with a fisherman who wakes up and says, isn't that a wondrous thing? The dragon sinks to the bottom. All the treasure that it couldn't consume, which sunk to the bottom. As the island goes down, the island is the dragon. It's going to suck up all that stuff. And then out of the waves is going to come this dragon in full glory with its new manifestations and mutations from killing the other dragon. It gains abilities from the dragon it kills. It's going to change it a bit. It's going to become a little something different. They were bound in battle. So when that dragon comes out, it's going to be pretty badass looking. Big. It's already big. It's as big as an island. So it's already going to be big. It's going to come out and it's going to be in the air and it's going to remember the players and the actions that they performed and the fishermen of which it may do something. In the modules, dragons have the capacity to restore life a bit in the instance of their own life being restored. So he has a very limited ability. If by some chance one of the players fell, it could bring him back to life, potentially. The fisherman's old. It could degenerate its age back down to younger years. And the fisherman is young once again, right? Could be, definitely. Thank you for assisting me. This is the gift I restore to you. It could just not and take off and stay bound to the fisherman and he won't die. Even though he's old, his age, he won't feel it as much. 
he'll be aged in his presence because dragons age in their presence, but it doesn't cause negative effects upon their form. They get more powerful when they age, not less powerful. So in the mentality of a reflection to a human, their body would age physically, but they wouldn't feel those things. They would still regain or retain their youth and vigor and things that they can do. It's kind of how the process works. That's how I look at it from the aspect of contingency. I have a whole uh, stream that I did a while back there talking about dragons and how we look at them in the space. Uh, but yeah, so there is foundational modular modules, modules in motion that create more modules. We could take a look. We could look at the logistics of this one with the dragons. This is pretty straightforward. We've looked at the other ones. We've got thousands upon thousands of modules could be created from this just in combination. So we'll look at the dragons. We've got the two dragons. We'll keep it simple for the basics. So we've got two dragons. They battle. The dragons move on. They do their thing. Okay. We have the island itself. We have all the different things on the island space. Those are all variables we don't have to determine, so I won't factor them in into the basic. Because depending on what things people go into and how they interact with the island space, that could change. They may or may not be successful and they just adventure on this floating island and know nothing about the dragon. They could know nothing about the oncoming dragon until the dragon arrives. They may be gone by then. Come back to the island, find a dragon's there, still knowing nothing of the background, like I said. They can, they can adventure in the module, they can adventure with the module, and they can adventure around the module. The module can still take shape still supports the space in all directions, inside out, upside down, sideways, right? The whole thing. The joy of making foundational module. That's all I ever built. So we have the dragon's heart, which is on its own in that instance. We have the fisherman. So we have him. We also have the village in that instance. Like I said, this is a pretty overlapping module. So we have the... Success and fail of either dragon. So we have that component-wise. It goes both directions. We have the player's success and fail, potentially. We'll go with a typical adventuring party of five people. We have the restorative capacity of the dragon or the dragon's defeat. So we have to factor that in. And we also have the success and fail of the other dragon, notching out his claim here and, and also claiming the heart of the other dragon. And then we have the potential of the players being bound or other dragons offshore, so I will keep that to a minimum. So in combination, based off of that, because there isn't really anything else, everything else ties to the logistics up to that point everything past it so once we reach the midway point on this particular one all the logistics afterwards are still tied to the logistics in the front they're not creating new expansions to the logistics so they had stopped expansion uh in that capacity so with nothing else but the module no player input just measure of success and fail only on the space we can create 480 combinations of how this module could play out probability wise. That's pretty good. It has got a range of combinations. By itself, it creates right around about 60, less than the 150. But again, we're really pushing the boundaries of it. The more specific you get, the less capacity of expansion it has. If we develop modules like they do in the industry currently, very railroady using action mechanics that are tied to the uh, economy, action economy that players can do, it limits the space down to a usually a range of 25. It has a really hard time going by. It could go up to 30 if you added more players to the space, or if the range of the module had more levels to it, the capacity for the range increases. Usually it's around 25. 15 to 30 is about the most that they can do. Most of our modules that we create is 60, double that, in increased combination of specifics. This one's very specific and pretty epic, I think. Uh, it's got a lot of stuff happening within there. You can't see the bridge. 
and you can't see the trolls. You don't know anything about the space at all. I kept them hidden until they get into the space, of which they find the bridge. It's presented in front of them. And then they find the troll. And then they find the other troll. So it's almost backwards in the sense of which they would know the space. The one with the king and the dying, the dying king and the heir. We left them in the front, but we created multiple paths of opposition. There are more than one troll moving on the bridge. And the bridge can be torn down and rebuilt in this module. So we made that one do that. In this module, sticking to the script as a follow-up to the original Billy Goat's Gruff, as a troll bridge, right? So almost every single design can, troll bridge can be applied. It's not a matter that Billy Goat's Gruff has it and that's it. It's just the first time that it was in a space tangibly purposefully in the instance thereof to tell a story and create heroics within it. So the, the goats in here are the heroes, a goat. And there is an opposition and there is a measure of success and fail inside. That's the first time that a story used those components at their base. It's called Troll Bridge because that is the lowest amount of combinations you can have. You have one side for and one side against, like I said. You have the measure of success and fail in between. One is opposition. Always. The troll. And you have the measure in between, which is the bridge. It has supporting components to it in order to make it function. They may or may not be required. And the bridge has the capacity to be designed multiple ways, just like in the story. If the story switches the different variations of the way the goats cross the bridge, the story changes exponentially. Same thing with the way that the troll is in the story. If the troll is taken out of the picture, the story changes dramatically, and the story is left open in the end. In that design, when I build foundational modules, that's how we build them, because the module has to build more modules, always. It has to build more modules within itself, because we know we're not just writing the story for us. We're writing the story for everyone. The space is ranged, and it needs to be designed at range. And this is not that extensive. These here can be run just how they are. If I write this and put this on the quick play sheets, which I have, this dragon one here, which I'm going to run uh, probably first, when I run that module in the space, if I run it with groups that I've ran modules with before, they wouldn't know. Even though I took an entire year and only ran Troll Bridge as the foundational design. We've got a bunch, like I said. You know, uh, yesterday I ran, hypothetically, I ran one, uh, it's an older one, Goldilocks, right? With the three bears. Strip it down to a foundational components and what it has. It has some very specific things going on in that story. Stripped it down. We've got Robin Hood, right? We've got um, loose ends. We've got logistical trolls where the trolls are always in motion. This one's almost borderline to that, but... The trolls are in motion towards the bridge, not the trolls in motion somewhere else to create bridges somewhere else. Um, we've got punishment for success. That one's always fun. Um, I talked about Frogger yesterday, where from every direction, the players are being bombarded with things. They can't focus on one thing because there's something else coming their way. They have to be in focus in all directions. We put the pressure back on the players instead of the pressure on the DM in that case, the GM or GO, right? Uh, I also ran Leave the Light On because I was working on another module. Leave the Light On is where there isn't combat. It is a matter of the players reaching a space in which they are going to be resting. In Tavern, city where there isn't combat. Space in which they are interacting with the space in a non-combative way. It's not designed for combat. It's just designed for them to find a space that welcomes them in all the different variations that they could be. Sort of a pause from a very lengthy campaign series, we'll say, for that particular group. 
So I had to dig the boxes and dig that one back out. That one was way in there to, to pull it out. So I have some different, I have quite a range. Over 400 foundational designs at this point. I've wrote over 40,000 modules easily. Not a question. I've got storage boxes of them all. They're, they're just ridiculous. And they always build something else. If I take them and put them in a space and I show everyone and I say, hey, here's this. In that space, you watch your thing you make. Build so many different combinations of it. And everyone is still sharing on that foundational story. Because the foundation is there. All the variations that happen within it, because of the design, is supported. So they're all just cranking it out. And when they think a thought, it's right there. We've got you covered. We know what you need because we took a look at the logistics. We take a look at the components. It's really the only way to set down and do stuff. Trying to do it the other way creates so much burnout and so much extra work, it's just not worth it. And we are, tomorrow, going to be taking that module. We got a module. We already started peeking at it. Um, Scepter Tower of Spellguard. We're going to be stripping it down. It's a 4E Dungeons and Dragons module designed second to fourth level players. We're stripping it down. We got to page five. It's a hot mess already. I've already run that module. Tom. It's, I've got it memorized. But I'm, I have the capacity to look at it, and go into it differently, look at it with new eyes, we'll say. Because I said I'm going to fix it for the last time because I always get calls and I got to go in and, and change it because I like to switch it up. I peel it out back to its base and then I go in and I put the components in place and then I, I run it as it is. I pick another component when I go in there and run it as it is. I can't run the module as it sets. It's too much of a mess. And that isn't the only one and it's not the only brand like I always said. They all have issues. We'll hop over here. Uh, whoop. We'll hop over here to the, the chit chat screen. I hit both the other buttons for a second. Getting tired. Um, but in the in the instance thereof, and I'll I'll pull it up. Let me uh let me swap screens here of where we're at so far. Because I got some stuff in here already. We already started pulling a few things, but we'll go back to it. Let me yank it up here. Come back over here. I had to play around in OBS earlier here today. Um, I was moving things around. That's why my, my butts are in a different spot. Anyway, Scepter Tower Spellguard, right? So this is the one we're going to be taking a look at. We're going to be peeling it apart. 4E module, like I said. That's the cover. Love it. Here. These creatures here on the cover. With nothing else but just these creatures and the image of the tower behind there. I can write an entire module right now with this. Not going to be their module, obviously. I can just make a completely different module, foundational and everything, by extracting what I'm looking at and create a story from this setting right here. Better than what they have inside the module. Just what I'm looking at. Knowing nothing but what I see. Anywho, back to the module itself. The back jacket pitches it. And then it starts to compress and counteract what it has inside the module's design. It explores the space in a way that the wording doesn't jive with its space. And I'm going to go over that because we're going to go over it a little farther tomorrow. It says that the height of Nithril's power, the fortress of Spellguard, held many great secrets of the Empire of Magic. That's their first sentence. In reality, these words are in the wrong sequence. It creates the wrong direction of expansion. It needs to be changed, and the words from the second section need to also be stripped apart and separated properly. And then those proper pieces need to go into the front sentence, the very first one, to fix it. We're going to be doing that on stream tomorrow. I'm going to show you how that works. And I'll explain it a little more in detail when we do that. Because it then goes on and it says, Now only ruins remain. And one last guardian, the near mythical Lady Sorel. Those prophetic visions, or whose prophetic visions, draw the desperate and the doomed from across Faerun. But a dark presence in one of the spell guards' intact towers wants to control the power of prophecy for itself 
and remake the future in its own image. Okay, and it says protect the future, right? Okay. The space itself, one, we need a bridge. It begins doing that a bit, but not really. It creates the lady as the bridge instead of the location where she is. It's the wrong order of things. The last sentence needs to get moved into the design further up. And the middle half sentence needs to get moved to the bottom. The rest of the pieces from the second sentence need to get moved into the first sentence. And the first sentence needs to get rearranged logistically because it's not right. Then it can be repitched, and it paints the proper picture. Protect the future can stay up top if they wish. But these words are in the incorrect sequence. They create a disruption in the space because they're not flowing the design between the components that it should. We're going to turn this into a troll bridge because that's what it is. Like most modules are troll bridge at the base. There is a way to change them and move them around, but the troll bridge process will help you dissect it down and make corrections. It's the fastest way to do prep when you have to take a module and turn it into something that you can use. You have to take it back to base. Troll bridge will do that. It will help you make that. The mechanics are 357. That's what I use. And it expands in the particular fashion, right, when we do it. So the module, right, I said, it's got a lot of good things going for it. Visually, the 4th edition module package is great. It has some rooms for improvement, but not much. It's pretty well and good. If we adapted the design from this in current 5e text base, combine the two together, we could create a pretty well and good visual image for this. I don't mind the mistakes on here visually graphically because they can be corrected easily to make the design more appealing visually it's really good because of how it then can be mechanically and physically used because of the design on how they design the inside of the module and how the module breaks down but again not quite a hundred percent because they didn't put pieces in motion in the left folder that you can use the ones you need to reference often and the actual module module in the right one. They didn't separate them out properly. It needs to be redone in order to make that work. We're going to fix it so that it will have that process in there. We're not going to be using the 110 pages that they have to make it happen either. So in here where we've got the tower, we've got the map of the location. These are the two most effective maps they have. That's why they're the only ones I put here. Because the other maps they have inside don't really do the space justice. I could, instead of the map that's appeared up top here, because that map that they use for doing all their encounters mostly doesn't work in the space because it's not in the space. The space isn't that map. It's like from a completely different space. It doesn't match anything inside this image we're looking at here. There isn't anything that this lines up with. So you can say, well, this is here, or that's here. It's very generic, very distant. Vaguely can it even be attached to the space with anything but the coloration of what they use for the map. The physicality of it, garbage, useless, no good. Got to go in the trash. The spell tower, okay, it's not bad. I'll use it. But it doesn't reflect what the spell tower looks like on the map which pisses me off because they should be better than that, right? There's no reason for it to not look like it on the map itself. They're missing a bunch of these pieces. They're here and they're not over here. They could have just cropped this out and then sized it down and said, oh yeah, we're missing some stuff at the very least. Make a shadow of it here so we knew and highlight it whatever color they want. I don't care. At least it would look visually in comparison to that. They didn't, but that's okay. We've got our map, right? So we know, and we peeled out some of the basics from it already. 
I went in and grabbed some things from somewhere else because they didn't even use things that they already had already. They were scared to use their own branded material because they're like, well, we didn't put it in this edition. It doesn't matter. There's no reason why you can't use it from a previous one. You're still using the same mechanics. The game hasn't changed. It's not called Pixies and Dragons or Trolls and Mountains. It's called Dungeons and Dragons. That's the brand. And every book has that on it. Doesn't matter what the edition is. They create brand wars in their mind. But their game doesn't. It's not that divided. I know because I've stripped it down to its base and repaired it multiple times. It does not do that. They do that. So there's some other creatures that they have, and I pulled them out. Some visual references here of what I want to do with the space to make the corrections, because they've missed some things that they didn't look at. We're looking at a desert here. That's where Spellguard resides, and it has a massive range around it in which there is nothing. Either this space here was wiped out by magic of the space, Typically, in the Forgotten Realms, there are things called mythals, and I think what happened, magic-wise, is something that caused it to collapse down. In the module, it hints at that. They don't really explore it properly, but we're going to fix that. We're going to take a little closer look. We've got to pay homage, right? We don't want Ed Greenwood upset that his space wasn't represented properly, so we're going to make sure it is. And it's Dungeons and Dragons, not just the Forgotten Realms. So we have to layer in Dungeons and Dragons into it. So we'll fix it and we'll do what I did to Dungeons and Dragons. Finish Gary's design. Because Gary was in the process of doing that. And they're in the process of undoing that with 5th edition. So I've already fixed it permanently. So you won't have to have to go back to the drawing board again. But we're going to take it back to base in order to repair this module. Because it can be turned foundational. You'll see what it can do when we do that. So it says, spell guard destroyed by some event that left a lasting residual magic upon the location. That was my extraction from the design of the module. By moving their words in the proper order, spell guard was destroyed by some event that left a lasting residual magic upon the location, which should be 100% the focus, and they are totally missing it. A mythal failure or a magical plague? Well, we already know the plague happened. And it does wipe out most of the magic. So if the mythal was containing the space, absolutely. This could be a floating city. And it crashed down. And when you drop something down, sometimes the walls will be a remain intact. Sometimes not. And everything else could get crushed, destroyed, pushed in. And then the sands come washing in because obviously it destroyed everything. It negated existence of things around it magically. Wiped everything out. Disintegration, right? And there was nothing. It ate everything in the space. Could happen. Or it could just have been sitting there in the space and then was destroyed from something. So, I say in here, tidbit of information and it comes from the module. Single survivor, Sorceress Lady Sorel. Her prophetic visions exists beyond death. Very purposeful because they didn't even look at those pieces. The pieces I put here are pieces they didn't look at in the module. What they missed completely. There are also other things in the space that they didn't look at, like the Maru, which is a race of the flesh, more or less. They're necromancers that focus on mummification. Well, this location's got some things going on. There are things on the move. It is wiped out. They are in this area. They did nothing with them. Uh, it's a desert. Everything here is dead. They got lots of stuff to work with. Why did we take the time to put kobolds here in the list of super stupid ranged monsters for encounters randomly that don't even match the biome in which this module is placed? It's like they're going back to old BX and only grabbing from that single list. It's not the first time, right? Obviously, I've already ran the module millions of times. So I know already what they've made mistakes with. But from an outside perspective, looking at it for the first time, we'll say that's what it comes off to. Instead of putting the kobolds here, they had the Baku, which is a goblinoid race that seeks water in the depths of the deserts. Why didn't they use them here? 
because they already could. They're here and they make more sense. Cobalts, useless. Because there's a bunch of catacombs and tunnels underneath the city. But why? Who cares? What are they digging for? Digging down to the different things that are buried under the sand? Well, we know they're not buried under the sand because the walls are above here. They're all standing up. There's towers above the ground. The city isn't built under the ground. So what are they digging for? There isn't anything down there in reality. It's already gone disintegrated and finished. So the only reason they would be digging down is to look for something else. And there's tunnel systems all over, and even then they didn't do the network over this location. I took this map and I drew with a marker and connect the locations to the tower. Just drug them around, connected each of them to each other, and to the tower. I took the lines from that and made them into tunnels, connecting them all together underneath the city. And I said, why would they be digging to this location? Makes sense, right? And I said, well, there's a burial ground here, obviously. They bury in the, in the center within it to protect it. The king's tomb, most likely. But we know there is no king. There's a queen. Because in the module, it says Lady Sorrel was a previous ruler of the city. And she's a sorceress. So what are they doing, right? Anywho... The terrain around the place, they did nothing. But there are other things out there because it's an iron-rich location. The mountains are there, tons of iron. Dunes and trees and things like that, the trees absorb all that, that metal from the ground and they become iron, more or less. Petrification from the absorption of the iron-rich water reserves that exist beneath the dunes, which petrifies the tree itself, turning it into the iron thorn trees, which is the closest monster within the book. But those aren't even in there. So we stopped at that point, right? Five pages in, we have a, a hell of a thing already, right? Front and back of just the basics, nothing more, of which we have to apply in this space here, which we will. We are going to do that. We'll pull it apart and we'll stick it in there and we'll, we'll make some corrections. But I am going to go back. I'm going to take a look and I will pull this up and then we will hop off here for a bit. So on here, we'll just make sure that it pops it up on there. It should. Just pull it right out. Let me double check. It's got a bit of a delay between here. I'm using the phone. It's not that good. Um, okay, yeah, it's popped up. So right on here, we have the breakdown of the troll bridge, right? A narrowed space that must be successfully passed or conquered in order to progress forward, guarded by some force. This location may or may not be well known. It may be in favor of or working against progress on either side of the opposition, individually or against both, right? And we take a look at it. We've got the entity on either side, for and against, conflict in the center somewhere across the bridge with a measure of success and fail. This is the most primitive design of fantastical spaces that you can get. Stories, Pretty much everything you can possibly do. This is the lowest combination. I created this to use for modular design because I can use this to diagnose and extract the module down to its base and then expand it back out from there to repair a module that has issues and to reduce the amount of time it takes to do prep. I needed it to do that because I was running a lot of spaces. So I built it. It is a tool, an engine, as much as it is a thing tangibly, mechanically a little bit, but more like a formulaic of design that I created to make it happen. Called it Troll Bridge, because in essence, that's what it is. Gives a good visual representation, because visually, this is what you're looking at. And it helps with that reference, because in that instance of that, it changes it up. And makes you think because then you can look at it in that way so covered a lot made two badass modules expansion wise exponential because they'll just keep creating that's just looking at the probability of it with the basics of a player interaction if the player groups larger more probabilities player group smaller a little bit less probabilities Foundationally, they make right around 150 different possible combinations with no one in the space. 
Not a single person in there. Just the story pieces in motion, logistically, which is a range. It's quite extensive. You could sit there and create module after module after module from just one module, which we've shown, obviously. One foundational design can build many. It can also repair other designs so that their foundation works. Self-checking system. That's why I designed it, right? It's designed to do that. Excellent process. And we've done it in real time and made three really cool modules. I'm keeping them all and using them all in the contingency system. And they're shared on here, so published already, right? Like I said, anything in this space is for this space or for private use, not for publication, of course. So tomorrow, when we hop on, what we're going to do is we're going to work on that module. That's a mess. It's going to take a bit to strip it down, peel out the pieces, and we're going to go section by section. I'm going to take a little bit of time in the morning and create sort of a little framework there for us to record everything over from the one space because I'm not going to sit there and type it all. It's 110 pages. It's going to take a bit to do that. So I've constructed a way to extract the text from it so I can edit it and move it around a little bit faster. That's why I was moving around this and I had a couple of different glitch clicks there because I moved some of these screens around a little bit in here that I normally navigate. So my brain's moving them in the spot where they normally are, but they're not there. I moved them to a different one. So I got to get used to where they're at. Um, but yeah, we got some other things too, besides just tabletop RPG. But this is a big section. What we're covering right now with modular modules, from prep, where we were, all the way over here to just dissecting, which is the next component of an existing module. We've covered all the basics in the center part, and then we're going to go back to what we were doing. We've got a lot of videos on here showing us making modules, I mean, right in real time. We've made some serious ones. We made modules that build worlds from the module. Because uh, we've got a world we're building completely backwards, the world of Grigor. So in any direction, we can create and create exponentially. We're not using their broken design. We're built a completely new one from the ground up. And I've been using it for well over 30 years, 40 years at this point. Because even when I was in my younger days, right, because I'm getting old, in my younger days when I was using uh, adventure design, even their designs I didn't like. So I created outside of it. And that was more like how this is with the quick play system. Designed to be able to be picked up by anyone with zero experience and zero knowledge base. And the space will help them create and inspire them to create, support them to create from that space. There's so many different ways those modules can be run. And they're all right. <laughs> because they're all going to be supported in whatever direction. The, the players could go in, know nothing about either dragon, run into neither dragon, and just be fighting monsters and stuff on the place. And getting treasure because there's treasure all over the place. It was part of the dragon and the dragon's body expelled it through its pores. It's got coins coming out of every year location. It could have a sword that's sticking up somewhere in there that its body e e ejected it right from its biological. Because when the Jacundrum is active, it moves things around and can alter the dragon's biology completely. It's the contingency system. There's so much things happening within the dragon. It's, it's magical, literally. It's part of its foundation. So it's a hell of a module. That one has got a range, obviously. We completely hit the bridge and we hit, we hit the trolls. <laughs> so they don't even know there's any trolls for our bridge. So they're just completely absolved until they start moving around the space. And then they're like, oh, frick, there's a troll here. Didn't know that. And then they're like, oh, there's a bridge. And I'm like, yeah, I hit him. Yeah, you found him, darn. Well, the module's all so versa. Towards the end, they find it. Uh, but we hit it pretty good. In the other one with the king and the heirs and the opposing forces, we, we hit it enough. We gave it enough range. They don't notice it, but it's still the same platform. We built three separate, completely different modules only using that foundational platform from three Billy Goats Grow. Troll Bridge, right? My, my build out from that, that story. Took the story, took it to its foundation. It's blank now can build whatever story we want from that space. And I can dissect really anything. Even this one, Scepter Towers Felguard, I can dissect it down to what its base is and then turn it foundational. And their design, you wouldn't notice it was even anywhere in there. I can destroy their design and toss it after I fix and repair it. And it makes completely different modules from that same space. They won't know it. 
it won't show it. And if you build out from it, it is absolutely not it. They wouldn't know, even if you put it in front of them, that they could build their module from it, because it will be able to do that. It will build the module. And when they start plugging their components into that, because that's not how they built theirs, if I plug their components into it, it will start to show us where they need to go. It will move them where they're supposed to go properly. And you'll go, oh, okay, I see. This needs to move here because it's in the wrong spot. That can't be there because that's not where it goes. We got to get rid of that. It doesn't belong here in the space. That can't be worded like that. It overspecifies this and eliminates this general concept. So we either got to reword it or that's got to go. It will help you dissect and repair the design. We're done. It's not going to be 110 pages. I know that already. I've already had to do it so many times because I've ran that module quite a lot, especially when it came out because we had 13 groups at the FLGS. When it came out, obviously, the store wanted me to run it. I had to buy the module and then run it. Then I get to keep the module after. And I'm like, but I have my receipt because I bought it. It wasn't like you gave it to me for free. <laughs> and I wasn't compensated or paid for that entire time. And I was running so many modules. It was ridiculous. It's running like, I don't know, it was over 100 hours every time. It was just ridiculous. So then I started training some other people because I was like, come on. <laughs> I've been doing this for like 25 years. So it's getting old. Let's do something a little different. I started running my stuff in the FLGS space not just my events. And they steered towards that versus theirs. They actually just quit doing their stuff is what ended up happening. And I just ran mine. Unless it was FLGS day, right? Game day. Or they had some event and they needed a space. Then I went and did it. But the rest of the time, I just ended up running my stuff. Might as well, right? Get the game testing out. And might as well run it all and teach them how to do it. And they loved it. I had every single combination of tabletop RPG all in the same space. And they couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> they were all playing. They're all like, oh, well, they're not playing the same system that I am. And I said, yeah, I know. I said, I'm using contingency to build a bridge. I build a bridge that they didn't build. So I could bridge them all. No problem. <laughs> I take care of it up here and the paperwork and the mechanics of it takes care of it down there. I said, you are all playing your character with 100% to your space, and I'm repairing your space, so your space is better, which is how you're able to play in this space. Because you're just like, wow, my character's awesome, and I'm doing this cool stuff. Yeah, I'm creating the moments of heroics for you that your other space would normally destroy and take away, because that's what usually happens, is it gives and takes away too much, and it's improperly balanced, and we removed action economy and replaced it with action logistics, so that it can move and expand in all directions instead of being required to just run it as a checklist. And it's in the front that way, and action logistics are in the back. So it's more focused on the player instead of the freaking mechanics sitting there, drowning out and stopping everything like a giant stop sign. Nope, 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 nope. Green light, green light, red light, red light, yellow light, yellow light. I was like, no, cut all the traffic lights down. Get the, get the chainsaw out. There are no traffic lights. Use your brain, make some decisions, drive around, you'll be okay. No problem. So yeah, long one. Again, this is the last piece of that big puzzle, right? So we've covered all three of the major components of it across the three streams here recently. But there's tons of stuff before, and we've already done this design a million times. But this is a deeper dive, right? It's time for the deeper dive, so we went deeper. And we're going to tear a module apart tomorrow. One of theirs, we're going to pick on them. Because uh, they can get picked on. They deserve it. Uh, they're at the top, so hey, why not? I was thinking it was it was close, because it was almost Pathfinder. And I was like, ooh, that green running one was right underneath. And there's other ones. I've got all the way back into Star Wars and 2nd Edition uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I've got Chainmail stuff. I've got FLGS stuff that wasn't even in there from private developers. Got tons of D20 stuff all over the place. I got a lot. I've got Mouse Guard stuff. I've got everything. <laughs> So, you know, we, we could have been playing uh, and stripping apart a module for uh, Battletech, <laughs> whatever. They all can be stripped down because they're all still using the same design. They don't understand the space as well as they could. Again, it's not their fault. It's never been instructional. They went down and tried doing design work and build it, and they built something, and they're using it, but it can be improved quite dramatically. So, yeah, appreciate it. 
thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.